name is Saeed Malamin. I am the student director of the Mill series at Lafayette. Tonight, we have a debate on de capitalism and democratic socialism. The format of the debate is simple. Each debater will make a 10-minute opening statement, followed by two questions from the moderator. Then we will open it up to the audience for a Q&A, followed by five minutes closing statements from both debaters. Tonight, we have with us Yaron Brook. Yaron Brook is an Israeli-American entrepreneur, active writer, and activist. He's an objectivist and the current chairman of the board at the Ayn Rand Institute, where he was executive director from 2000 to 2017. He will be arguing on the side of capitalism. Sam Arnold is a professor of political theory at Texas Christian University. His area of, fo of focus is in liberal egalitarian theories of justice, especially the work of John Rawls, the division of labor and work, consumerism, and voluntary simplicity, socialism and alternatives to consumer capitalism. He will be arguing on the side of democratic socialism. Hi, everyone. Due to some audio issues at the outset, we lost the first few seconds of Sam Arnold's presentation. He began simply by stating that he will focus on one core problem with capitalism, namely that capitalism creates a class society. He then says, quote, a tiny elite owns most of the stuff, unquote. We pick things up there. This is just an undeniable fact about American capitalism and indeed about all capitalist societies. So here are some facts to back this up. Uh, according to the Federal, Re Federal Reserve 2016 Survey of Con Consumer Finances, uh, the top 10% of our country owns 77% of the country's wealth. Top 10% owns 77% of the pie. The bottom 60% owns 3.2%. Just 3.2%, the bottom 60% of the country. According to the New York Times, the richest 1% in our country now own more wealth than the bottom 90%. And according to, uh, you know, from a global perspective, things are, of course, even more unequal. So according to a 2019 report released by Oxfam, uh, globally, the richest 26 people on Earth own as much wealth as the bottom 50% of humans. So 26 people, the richest 26 people, own as much as the bottom 3.5 billion. Okay, these are just the facts about capitalism. Uh, capitalism is a class society in which a tiny elite owns most of society's productive resources, whereas uh, most people own nothing. Now, inevitably, defenders of capitalism will reply, and this is a reasonable reply, who cares? Who cares about wealth inequality? Uh, as long as everybody has enough, who cares if some people have more than enough? Uh, indeed, you might even think it's just envy or resentment that motivates socialist complaints. It's like we want to be like the 26 billionaires who own as much as the bottom 3.5 billion or something. But this reply fails. Uh, it fails because, first of all, not everybody has enough. Um, certainly, globally, not everybody has enough. Many basic needs are not being met. But even within our own extremely affluent country, not everybody has enough. So here again are just some, some facts. Uh, the UN Special Reporter on Extreme Poverty took a trip to an unexpected location in 2017, you know, not Haiti, um, not, not someplace in South America, not someplace in Africa, instead to the United States. And the UN Special Reporter on Extreme Poverty did not like what he saw. He, he described our situation accurately, in my opinion, as private splendor, and public squalor. And he added that the US has the worst poverty in the developed world. Uh, indeed, according to the Rutledge Handbook of Poverty in the United States, nearly 100 million Americans live either in poverty or near poverty. 100 million Americans. 2.8 million kids live in households earning less than $2 per day. And there are over 600,000 homeless people in the United States. We could, 44% of whom, by the way, work. We could go on. The point is, the, the capitalist reply, who cares about wealth inequality, everybody, as long as everybody has enough, who cares about inequality? And it, my initial response is, well, hold on, not everybody has enough. So isn't it morally grotesque to allow billionaires to keep their stuff when we have 600,000 homeless people? Secondly, 
and perhaps more deeply. Even if everybody did have enough, even if we did get rid of poverty, still wealth inequality would be a problem. This is so for uh, two main reasons, although in the interest of time, I might, I might just stick with one. Um, um, would you make sure that he gets extra time too? Yeah. Okay, all right. As, as a socialist, I want equality, so make sure, all right. Uh, I'll go for two problems then. I, I could go all day about the problems of capitalism, but I'll, I'll restrict myself to two. So the first problem, the, the first reason why wealth inequality as such is a problem, even if we got rid of poverty. This is so obvious that it, it almost doesn't even need mentioning, but um, wealth equals power. When you have a tiny class of people, uh, you know, the top 10%, top 1%, top 0.01%, that, that owns most of the stuff, they're going to dominate politics, economy, and society. This is, this is not just me making this up. So uh, in, in uh, 2014, some uh, influential political scientists from Princeton and Northwestern released a, a really important uh, paper in which they found, quote, ordinary citizens have little to no influence on public policy at all. So who does have influence? No surprise. Quote, it is, the, it is individual economic elites and corporations, which are largely owned and controlled by wealthy elites, that affect public policy. So 2014 academic study finding that ordinary people have no, literally, literally no influence on public policy, whereas uh, economic elites drive public policy. So the first problem here, uh, people, is that we don't live in a democracy. We live in a plutocracy. In our, in our system, it's wealthy people who, who run uh, the show, economically and politically. Now, inevitably, capitalist defenders will say, well, who cares? Uh, it's, it's, a lot of my students say this when we talk about socialism and capitalism. A lot of my, a lot of my students are conservative at, at TCU. And they will, at this point, reasonably say, um, well, you know what? Rich people probably know what they're doing. Uh, they didn't get rich by accident. So if, if anybody's going to be in control, rather the rich than the poor. Well. There are two problems with this reply. First, that ain't how democracy works. <laughs> we didn't sign up for plutocracy. We signed up for democracy. We're supposed to have political equality in this country. We're supposed to share the government together. But again, perhaps more deeply, um, the, the problem with this reply is that it, it completely ignores class conflict. Here's the reason why it, it's a big problem that the rich control everything. The interests of the rich are not identical to the interests of ordinary people. In fact, they're often quite deeply conflictual. So uh, one could illustrate this in a million ways, but uh, let me pick almost at random something from the New York Times from uh, this past year. Here's a headline. Koch brothers killing public transit projects across the US. Nashville was considering spending about $5 billion on a new public transit plan. The Koch brothers. Uh, poured money into a, uh, some sort of uh, lobbying group or, 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 or uh, uh, organization called Americans for Prosperity. Americans for Prosperity descended upon Nashville and uh, convinced enough people to vote against the project to kill it. Now, you might think the Koch brothers uh, just have an interesting theory of what would be good for the people of Nashville. Maybe, but I think more informative is the fact that a lot of the Koch brothers' uh, concerns are bound up with oil, automobiles, and asphalt. And so I think that's a more plausible explanation for why the Koch brothers are uh, killing these projects. Okay, let me move on to, uh, so thus far I've just been crit criticizing capitalism, right? It's a problem because we've got wealth inequality and uh, that's bad. So what's, what's an alternative? Um, the alternative is democratic socialism. Um, this can sound scary and a little, unf a little unfamiliar um, but I think really it's, it's quite simple. So I'm gonna explain this in two quick steps. First, just start with what economists call the Nordic model um, or social democracy. Countries like um, Sweden and Finland, Denmark. These countries are market economies with regular profit-seeking firms, uh, but they have high rates of unionization. They have very high levels of taxation and they have a very high level of social spending that goes to fund universal social benefits that goes to everybody. So uh, you know, universal health care, uh, universal higher education, et cetera. Now, I think this would be a gigantic improvement over what we have now. And quite honestly, if we just moved to, say, Sweden, you know, moved our country towards Sweden, I'd be happy. But socialists want to go even further because uh, the problem with, with countries like Sweden is 
although they're more egalitarian, there still is a, a capitalist class that owns most of, uh, most of the wealth. So the solution from the socialist perspective is to replace private ownership of productive assets with collective democratic social ownership of productive assets. This is, uh, it can be difficult to see how to, how to implement this in practice. Um, maybe in, uh, in, in, I don't wanna take any more time. So maybe in, in my next, next time, I'll, I'll, I'll say more about it. Uh, sorry for going over. No, okay, more. great, uh, so to be continued, thank you. <laughs> All right, so I, th I think the way we're going to do this is I'll, I'll make, I, I won't comment as much on the comments, and then we'll, we're going to do rebuttals, like five-minute rebuttals, where I'll comment more on my disagreements with pretty much everything you've just heard. Uh, but that's okay. He's going to disagree with everything I'm going to say, so we're doing this in a, in a, a friendly disagreement, but fundamental disagreement. Um, so the first thing I want to do, which I think is well, always important in a debate or, or in a presentation generally, is define terms. I think it's important to define your terms. Because one of the things I find when I debate people on uh, socialists or the, the various categories of socialists is that they never define capitalism. And what they use is, what they do is, they assume the world as it is today is capitalist and therefore all the ills of the world today are blamed on capitalism. So uh, three and a half billion people around the world are truly unbelievably poor. They're so poor that their net worth is negative. So indeed, I'm probably richer than like a billion of them. Just me alone, and I'm not a billionaire, just me alone, because they have negative net worth, and when you add negative numbers, what do you get? A big negative number. So it's easy to be richer than a lot of negatives. But are they living under capitalism is the real question we should ask ourselves, and clearly they're not. Like, people in Africa are not living in capitalism. People in Asia are not living in capitalism. Indeed, I would argue, and will argue vehemently today, that we in America don't live under capitalism, and there is no country in the world today that is a capitalist country. Capitalism does not exist in the world today. What we have is lots of countries that are mixed, a mixture of socialism and capitalism, socialism being statism, the state involvement, heavy state involvement, heavy state redistribution of wealth, and some property rights that are regulated, controlled by the state, are not true property rights, because I can't actually do what I want with my property. I have to get permission for almost everything that I do with my property. I, I used to live in California, that was the case. You need to get a permit to chop down a tree, you need to get a permit to redo your house, you need to get a permit for everything. That is socialism or statism, some form of statism. It certainly is not capitalism. So what is capitalism? So, for, so the definition of capitalism is a system of real free markets, where the state does not intervene in the economy, does not intervene at all. That is, capitalism is a system in which there is a separation of state from economics, in which the state does not intervene in economics at all. So I agree, cronyism is bad. Having a lot of money, therefore gaining political power, is bad. And indeed, the only way to prevent that and still be a little free, still be free at all, is by restricting the ability of the politician to have any influence on the economy. And therefore, there's never any reason to lobby the politician because he has no influence on the economy. He has no way of granting favors or penalizing the competition because that is banned. So capitalism is the system in which economy and politics are separated in which all property is private property, in which the state does one thing and one thing only, and that is to protect individual rights. Protect individual rights in the way somebody like John Locke would have conceived of individual rights. That is, the freedoms, freedom from coercion, the freedom to do, act, produce, live by your own judgment, based on your own ideals. And the only job of government is to protect you, make it possible for you to do that. And protect you from whom? Well, from other people. Because when we live in a society, there are going to be some people who are crooks, frauds, criminals, bad guys. And since we don't want to live in a society, at least I don't, there might be some anarchists in the room, but hopefully not. Um, since I don't want to be carrying all the time to you know, watch myself, we institute a government, an institution whose sole responsibility it is, it's to defend each one of our lives 
to defend our liberty, to pretend our, defend our property, because property is essential for life, and to protect our ability to pursue our own happiness. But basically, to leave us free as individuals to pursue the values that we believe are necessary for our own survival, for we, that we believe are necessary for our own life, to leave us alone. Right? So capitalism is the system where individuals pursue their individual values, their individual happiness, free of coercion, and the job of the government is to make sure that they are free. That's it. That's what capitalism is. I don't see it in America. I don't see it anywhere, indeed, in the world. To some extent, I would argue it's never existed. To the same extent, I think the socialist would argue that socialism has never existed in his kind of form. I don't think capitalism has ever existed. I think, but I do, will say this. So, so let, me, let me complete the moral argument and then I'll get to the practical argument. Now, why is this good? Why is this system right? Why is this system just from a moral perspective? Well, what is moral? What is good evil? What is right versus wrong? Well, the standard for me for determining whether something is moral is, is it consistent with human survival? Is it consistent with human flourishing? Is it good for human life? That which is good for human life, that which furthers human life is the good, that which destroys human life, attacks human life, is bad for human life, is evil. That, to me, is good and evil. That's right and wrong. That's the essence of morality. And it's an individualistic morality. Because what is human life? Human life is your life, my life, each individual. There is no class here. There is no group here. We impose those ideas on people. But as human beings, we're just us. We're just individuals. And as an individual, the values that are good for you the values that long-term lead to human success and human flourishing are the good, and the things that lead to human failure are the bad. Now, what is the most important thing if you believe in human flourishing, in human success, in human progress? What is the most important value for human beings, for individual human beings? What is it that makes possible success and flourishing as a human being? Well. You know, I, we don't have time to go into all of it, but please ask about this. It's our human capacity to reason. It's our capacity to think. It's our capacity to know the truth. It's our capacity to integrate the data from reality. It's our capacity to shape reality in order to fit our needs. That's what makes it possible for this human race to survive, because look at you, you're pretty pathetic animals otherwise, right? We're weak, we're slow, we have no fangs, we have no claws. You're not going to survive out there in nature without a capacity to reason, to think, to strategize, to invent, to innovate, to produce. What makes us different than any other animal is we're not programmed to survive. You actually have to figure out how to survive. So the most important thing about being human is our capacity to think. Now, thinking requires freedom. It requires the ability to try stuff out, to fail, to experiment, to do a variety of different things. Knowledge is not just embedded in our minds. We don't know what's right, what will work, what will succeed. We need to go out there and live and choose and make decisions and, again, fail sometimes and get back on our feet. The most important thing for human intelligence, for human mind, for human beings to flourish is their ability to think freely and to act based on those thoughts within freedom. Free of coercion. Force. Authority. Okay, I didn't see the signal. Force, authority, are the real enemies of the human mind. They are what limit our ability to produce, create, and, 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 and really live out there. So you want a system that protects our ability to think and act on our thoughts. That's capitalism. It's a system that eliminates the one enemy of thought, which is violence, fraud, people using guns, people using authority to dictate how you should live and how you should think and what you should do. Think Galileo. Right? Now, I'll just end with this. It turns out that when you leave people free, when you let people think, when you take away the authorities, 
when you take away state control and limitations. To the extent that you do that, and I said there's no ideal capitalist country yet, but there have been attempts to get there. To the extent that you do it, to the extent that you practice this freedom, to that extent you produce economic wealth, you produce economic success, you get rid of poverty. To that extent that you practice capitalism, you are successful in bringing about rising standard of living, rising quality of life, longer life expectancy. In every dimension, you improve human life. And to the extent that you do the opposite, to the extent that you use coercion, that you use force, you use authority to suppress human freedom, the, primarily the freedom to think and to act on that thought, to that extent you become poor, to that extent you suffer, to that extent life becomes miserable. That's the difference between capitalism and socialism. The one is a system based on individual freedom. The other is based on individual suppression and, and coercion. And, uh, and the consequences are obvious. One leads to wealth. One leads to disastrous poverty. Thank you. So in terms of definitions, I agree they're important. Um, I am, I'm surprised by, uh, by your, uh, your on, right? uh, your on's uh, definition uh, because, as he says, uh, by his definition, there are no uh, capitalist countries on earth. So just, just notice what an extreme position he's defending. Um, any, I take it you're defending an economy with no, with no state involvement whatsoever. So that is, that's setting the bar high for you, um, which I know you know, um, but I want to make sure they know. Um, so, okay, that's, that's point number one. Uh, that's, that's a pretty extreme situation. W well, why? Well, think about all, all of the things that government does, um, not in spooky Venezuela, <laughs> uh, but in USA, baby. Um, all the stuff that, uh, that the government does right here to promote, I'll use your, your concept here, freedom, which as a liberal egalitarian, I hold dear to my heart as well. Uh, freedom. I, th I think people who defend the sorts of positions you're defending misunderstand freedom. So there's formal freedom, which is freedom from interference, very important. There's also effective freedom, the freedom to actually accomplish things in the world. Um, both are important. Um, government, it's true, can be a source of, of interference. It can prevent you from dumping that coal ash in the river that you just really want to dump. Um, you know, you just, to, to live your best life, you want to dump that coal ash and the, the pesky government won't let you do it. Um, admittedly, it's a, it's a restriction on freedom, formal freedom. Uh, but it also yields freedom dividends, obviously. So when we impose restrictions on pollution, we augment the effective freedom to, say, develop in a healthy way without coal ash in your water. Without government, um, we would have much less effective freedom. Um, I would point out that all property, different point now, um, we shouldn't fetishize private property from the or any kind of property from the standpoint of freedom, even, even formal freedom. All property rights are restrictions on freedom. Um, this is my pen. He can't have it. Okay? This limits what he can do. I, if, if, somebody, if he comes and tries to take my pen, which I hope he won't because he's bigger than me, um, the police will come and, well, they probably won't, but I could theoretically <laughs> call the police and get them to interfere, right? That's what we have at Monterey. That's right, that's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. But the, the, point is, the point is simple. It's that um, proper, there's no simple mapping from property rights to freedom, even formal freedom, because all property rights represent interferences with people. Um, ask yourself how free homeless people are in our society. Um, they ain't free at all. They aren't free. They don't have formal freedom. If they try to sleep someplace, what's going to happen? The police will evict them. So even from the standpoint of formal freedom, uh, a sort of libertarian capitalism with no safety net at all would be a disaster. Um, but finally, uh, in, in defining what, in making the moral case for capitalism, um, you mentioned that uh, that which furthers human life and flourishing are good. Well, I agree. Uh, that's a good definition of good. Uh, that which promotes uh, flourishing is good. Well, I, I just am wondering how taxing, say, Bill Gates so that he can't buy a seventh yacht in order to fund, say, you know, vaccines for kids. 
uh, or public education or any of the valuable public purposes that our government serves? How is taxing Bill Gates for that, that purpose not furthering human life and human flourishing? So I, I submit that even by your own standard, um, you shouldn't embrace this kind of radical libertarian capitalism. The, the government does many good things. Um, may I'll stop there. Thank you. That's right. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, uh, just the ash in the river. Uh, let me just comment on that quickly. I, I'm sure there'll be environmentalist questions afterwards we can cover. But look, if the river's mine, you ain't dumping your ash in my river. And my definition of capitalism, the rivers are owned by somebody. They're not just out there aimlessly owned by nobody. So uh, you can't dump your coal in my backyard. You can dump your coal in my river. So the solution to externalities, what we call externalities in economics, is, not to ha is, is, to, is to privatize. Once you privatize externalities, for the most part, go away. Uh, I'm sure there'll be more questions on this. Let me make, I, I want to make one uh, uh, crucial point. By the way, I embrace the idea that I'm, what did you call it, extreme? Yeah. Absolutely. I'm radical. I don't like the word extremism. I don't think it means anything. I'm radical. Uh, you know, I, I believe in this all the way, right, in and, 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 and its purest form. Wealth is created. Wealth does, doesn't appear. There is no pie that we then get to divide up among people. Somebody has to create the pie. You create a pie. You create a pie. You create a pie. You can't then just take, and this is the definition of private property. The pie you created is yours because you created it. Because you build it and you do build it. You made it. You bought it. It is yours. Indeed, private property is not a rejection of freedom. It is a necessary aspect of freedom. There is no freedom without private property because to live, I need property. Whether I need property in order to, to grow vegetables so I can eat them, or whether I need property in order to build the machine that I'm going to sell and make a lot of money, or the factory that makes the iPhones, or whatever the property is, you cannot have life. And indeed, life sucks where there's no private property. I mean, life sucks. I really mean sucks. Really, really, really bad. <laughs> so freedom necessitates or private property. You cannot have one another. But, but let me go back to the pie. So the pie is not a social pie. It's not we created this pie now. We get to decide how to divvy this pie up. No, I created a pie. Keep your hands off my pie. Right? That's capitalism. I want to give out some of the pieces of the pie to some of you. I want to trade my pie for your pie. Fine as long as it's voluntary, as long as I don't steal your pie, as long as I don't take your pie by force, you can do with your pie anything you want to do as long as it doesn't violate the rights of other people, as long as it's not using force against others. You have a right to do with your pie what you want to do. Pies are not social and they're not static. That's the other thing, right? From 300,000 years ago, the beginning of Homo sapiens, you know, I, I, I'm willing to accept that that might be the wrong date, but somewhere a long, long time ago, when Homo sapiens began, until about 250 years ago, everybody on this planet was dirt poor, was under $3 a day or less. Everybody on the planet was like, there are a few aristocrats over here who, by our standards, were still dirt poor. They didn't have electricity, didn't have running water. And then something miraculous happened. We got a little bit of freedom. Not the full freedom I would like, but just a little bit. About as much as, you know, we've had. And what happened? Wealth creation took off. Took off. So that now we can say, you know, there were only three and a half billion people who were poor. Actually, the number's a lot less. According to the UN, extreme poverty is at the lowest it's ever been in human history. It's down to 8% of the population. Why? Because a few countries in Asia have adopted a little bit of capitalism. Imagine if they've adopted a lot of capitalism. There'd be no extremely poor people on planet Earth. So the only system that has ever brought people out of poverty, the only system that has ever brought people out of poverty is capitalism. And it's done such a spectacular job of doing it that it is striking that every place in the, on the planet that has adopted a little bit of capitalism has shrinking uh, extreme poverty. And every place on the planet that has not adopted capitalism is still extremely poor. Africa is the last continent to, to struggle with adopting capitalism. Rwanda, Botswana, uh, Namibia are starting to do that. Their GDP is going like this. 
They've adopted property rights. They've adopted the, the, some of the elements of what capitalism looks like. And, they, and suddenly, they're getting less poor. So if you care about poverty, which I think any, any human being cares about seeing able people who are poor stay poor, then capitalism is the only solution to solving the problem of poverty that still exists in the world. Thank you. What if there's a fundamental flaw in your premise? Many people here will be familiar with Jordan Peterson, and, and he's talked about uh, the dominance hierarchy, and that it's flat out wrong to blame that on, on, on capitalism, that the, the structure of the way we're made, the biology of the way we're made, it's, it's dependent. Like, there's a dominance hierarchy in all social uh, animals. All social species have that. Thanks for the question. Um, so I think, I think there's a, a misunderstanding. So I, I'm, I'm not blaming all hierarchy on capitalism. Um, for sure, there will be hierarchy. Um, there's hierarchy in Norway. Uh, there will be hierarchy in Norway even if it, it moved further left. Um, so there's going to be hierarchy in human relations. Not all hierarchy is problematic. Um, there, there can be some hierarchies that are they're great. I mean, on, on, I'm, I'm the coach of my son's soccer team. Um, I, that's not problematic, right? Uh, they need a hierarchy. Um, so the rich. So here, are, there are problematic hierarchies when we live in a democracy. Um, that's a fundamental premise. Maybe you guys don't want to live in a democracy, but I do. And that means political equality. And that is fundamentally incompatible with uh, the Koch brothers, for instance, not to pick on them too much, but they make such easy targets. Uh, spending, per the New York Times, over $800 million in the 2016 electoral cycle. Uh, that's, some, that's some problematic dominance right there, and that is due to capitalism, because in Norway, um, shifted to the left, nobody has $800 million laying around to spend on an election, because you don't have these grotesque excesses of, of, of wealth. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm not, I don't want to oversell socialism. It's not going to be you know, rainbows and unicorns and no, no uh, hierarchy. There will be all sorts of problems, but we won't have this problem of the rich, per se, dominating everybody else. But, but the rich are part of that dominant hierarchy. So the reason why people work really hard, the reason why they come to school, the reason why they're trying to improve themselves, it's to make a contribution to society. But it's also, so it's, it's part of this whole biological premise. Like they're, they're, they're peacocking. You know, part of the intellect is peacocking. Yeah. So they, when, you, when you criticize somebody like, say, what's wrong with, with taxing Bill Gates? Well, it turns out that Bill Gates employs just tens of millions of people. It's impossible to conceive of how many people Bill Gates, a single person, has affected. It's ar arguably that he's affected the entire world for the better. That's hard to say. Well, why don't we just take away his, his, all, of, all of his profit? Because some of these people, some people are corrupt, which I'll get to you. But, <laughs> I mean, but you know, can I answer this question too? Sure, sure. Because well, I disagree so, with you too. Okay. You know, well, well. I want to critique Jordan Peterson. All right, so I won't go on. What happens if you destroy the very class of people that are producing the means of production? Like he said, they don't just come out of mm -hmm. nowhere. It's not just there. It's not a pie that exists and you just seize it and now it's yours. Like, people are producing this. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, I take this broadly as an opportunity to talk about incentives to produce under a more egalitarian system. Why would people work if they faced steeper levels of income tax or wealth tax? Um, well, because they want to be richer than other people. And, and under socialism, you could still be richer. You just wouldn't, you wouldn't have the 300 to 1 split between CEO pay and average worker pay. Instead, in a lot of like um, cooperatives, like in the Basque region of Spain, Mondragon cooperatives that are a kind of model for, for a kind of socialist institution, uh, there, the highest paid employees make, say, four times what the lowest paid employees make. And they're perfectly competitive. But put Mondragon aside, just talk about our own country. Um, as I, I'm sure you both have heard this statistic, but I mean, back you know, the highest level of uh, the top marginal tax rates used to be much, much higher uh, in the 50s and 60s, um, indeed up to 90 percent. Was there an economic calamity? Did, did the dominant peacock say, I'm not going to show my peacock feathers off anymore? No, um, because it turns out that what human beings really want is to be better than the next guy. It doesn't matter necessarily how much better in an absolute terms, or, or it doesn't matter how much in absolute terms they have. It doesn't matter to Bill Gates whether he has $15 trillion in his bank account or a billion. He just wants to have more than Mark Zuckerberg. And you can have relative inequality under socialism. We're just not going to have this ridiculous 
absolute inequality where you've got people with trillions, you know, billions of dollars and people starving in the streets. So there, the big picture point then is socialism is perfectly compatible with allowing some inequality for the sake of incentives. So I, I hate this dominance theory. I think it's awful and terrible and it justifies the worst kind of elements that, that would be critiqued against, uh, that, that exist within society. Because it says that we're basically just regular animals. Some of us have this dominance thing and we're willing to step on other lobsters to get to the top and to hell with those other lobsters. And it's a zero sum world and we're gonna destroy the competition in order to get to the top. And it's all about relative. I wanna be better than the other guy. I think all of that is bullshit. I don't think any of that is true. We're not lobsters, we're human beings. And as human beings, we have the capacity to reason. We have the capacity to create stuff that doesn't exist before. We don't become wealthy at other people's expense like lobsters do. We actually create wealth that benefits everybody else around us because they all get to trade with us. So we don't rise to the top by stepping on other people like the lobster example. And we're not programmed to step on other lobsters and other human beings to advance. We and we're not motivated. I don't, I don't believe for one iota Bill Gates looks at the top 400 wealthy and figures out where he is relative and motivated by getting higher up on the top of the list. None of these guys are motivated by that. If you know billionaires, what they're, what they're motivated by is the love of producing, the love of creating something, the love of making something beautiful. Yeah, he didn't create the iPhone, which is somewhere over there, because he wanted to be richer than somebody else. He created the iPhone because he was inspired by something beautiful that could change his life and our life and trade for that. And yes, he wanted to make a lot of money, but the measure of money is not relative to other people. The measure of money is how much did I impact the world? Money is a symbol for how much value I've created. Because how do you become a billionaire? How do you become a billionaire? We talk about this abstraction of people having billions. But how did Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, uh, Bezos, these guys become billionaires? By trading with us. Did we win or lose from that trade? Well, why did we enter it? Why did we buy the iPhone? Why do we use Amazon? Because we believe that it makes our lives better. So we enter the trade because we believe we're going to make our lives better. So the only way for them to become billionaires is for millions, no, not millions, billions of us to trade with them in a way that we believe will make our lives better. So the only way for Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, and these guys to become billionaires in a free market, we'll talk about the corrupt ones in a minute, I guess, is by making the world a better place for everybody else. By applying their own mind to a problem that exists out there, a problem of human survival, a problem of human production, and coming up with the best idea and then trading with other people, making their lives better, in win-win relationships, in trader relationships, voluntary relationships, not relationship that imposed, not relationship that is your sum relationship, not lobster-like relationships. Human beings are different. We're not predetermined by, by genetics to invent iPhones. It doesn't work that way. There's no way that we're predetermined to invent iPhones. You have to make choices. You have to use your reason. You actually have to think to come up with an iPhone or any product that's out there. We don't, even this building. Animals don't do this. They can't. Right? So billionaires become billionaires by making the world a better place. They do it by creating wealth, not by taking wealth. And the fact that 26 people are richer than 3.5 billion is because 26 people have created objectively created more wealth than three and a half billion because the fact is the three and a half billion are barely surviving. They're f all they're doing is they're farming and they're eating what they produce. And I bet you the net worth, by the way, in this room, is, I'm probably richer than all of you combined or at least the students combined, I'll take out the adults, because your net worth is negative because you've got student loans. It doesn't mean I'm rich, it just means I have a positive net worth. So. 26 people actually created a lot of wealth. Three and a half billion, sadly, sadly, haven't created the wealth yet. If they, were ca if they lived under capitalism, they, would have, they wouldn't be that poor. We all know there are people, say for example, the Wells Fargo uh, crisis. It's just absolutely appalling. And when you look it up, they knew exactly what they were doing. And, and so 
You know, they were targeting people that couldn't speak the language. They were targeting people that were the elderly. These are the people, what is Wells Fargo? Like number four, number three of the biggest banks. So, and, and they, in order to drive, like, so we have this system of capitalism that incentivizes, like, growth. So in order to fake their profits, because, you know, they, they have to, to show the people that want security for their stocks to rise up, they are faking sales. Um, let me just, I, because you've mentioned Coke, Coke twice, let me just say that uh, the Ayn Rand Institute does get a little bit of money for the Koch brothers, so just for, for uh, uh, you know, they, they pretty much give everybody who's in the free market world some money, so just for full disclosure. Um, how do you protect against corruption? That's the only reason they have a government. It's to catch the crooks, right? That's the one thing the government should do. So if there's real fraud, then catch the real fraudsters. But the problem is today that that's not what the primary job of government is. So everybody remember Bernie Madoff? I know you guys are too young maybe, but Bernie Madoff, big pyramid scheme. He basically stole $63 billion from his friends and family members. Did the SEC catch him? SEC, responsible for protecting us from fraud in the securities market. Did they catch him? No. They got a report twice from a hedge fund who said, this guy's a crook. Here's what he's doing. And they couldn't catch him. They couldn't get him. Why? Why couldn't the SEC get him? Because the fact is the SEC is not about catching crooks. The SEC is about monitoring my behavior. I'm not a crook, just so <laughs> full disclosure. I happen, to have, I happen to be in the financial, in, in, in the financial business as a, as a business on the side, and I, and I do some buying and selling. But the SEC monitors everything I do. I have to file a 13D and a 13G and a 13 this and a, you know. And then, and then, they, <laughs> yeah. and then they, send, they send in their inspectors to, you know, I have a whole compliance office. I have a whole thing of compliance where they come in and look at my books. They're so busy monitoring what I'm doing that who has time to catch crooks? Indeed, they, never, they almost never catch crooks. It's rare that they actually file. Usually, who catches the crooks? The market does. In the case of Bernie Madoff, who caught him? Well, the hedge fund guy who wrote the memos twice, and who landed up at the end catching him? His son. His son called in the police. So if the government actually did its job, its one job, which is to protect us from crooks and criminals and fraudsters, the world will be different. And, and just to relate to the Wells Fargo example, in capitalism, there are no bailouts. By definition, capitalism is anti-bailouts. There's no too big to fail in capitalism. I'd go further. There's no deposit insurance in capitalism. Yet why do people keep their deposits in Wells Fargo in spite of the fact that they've committed fraud? Because who cares? If something really bad happens to Wells Fargo, the government's going to step in and pay me back, right? Unless you've got more than $250,000. Who's got more than $250,000 in the bank account? Like, okay, one guy, right? <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing, right? Um, right, they're trying to protect the little guy with the positive insurance. Really, how many little guys have $250,000 in their bank account? So the whole system is corrupt. The whole mechanism of the world in which we live in today is corrupt. Not corrupted by capitalism, corrupted by statism. As soon as you have deposit insurance, now you have to have the regulations to monitor the banks. And then if, if the bank is very big, it has systemic risks, so we have to bail you out. So by the way, if you have more than $250,000 in your bank account, here's a tip for those wealthy students among you. If you have more than $250,000 in a bank, always put it in a too big to fail bank. So Wells Fargo is a good place for 250000 Bank of America is a good place. Don't put it in your local community bank. Because when it fails, you won't get your money. You'll get everything up to 250, but not above. But if Wells Fargo fails, they'll bail them out. They've told us they'll bail them out. It's in the, so what, you talk about incentives. When you tell somebody, when you make money, you get to keep it all. But when you lose it, we'll bail you out. <laughs> what kind of behavior do you expect to get? Pretty, pretty nutty behavior, right? And that's what we get. So that's not capitalism. There's no bailouts in capitalism. There's none of this stuff in capitalism. Capitalism is a system where the government does one thing. It protects us from the crooks. And if only we had a little bit of that. One of these days we'll have to debate Jordan Peterson because... <laughs> so in the pockets of America where there's extreme inequality and poverty, many of the victims of the lifestyle live on the government's welfare policy. And in a, pure, in a purely capitalist society, what safety net exists where people are able to improve their own quality of life 
where there's such like where there's other where there's other inequalities such as like education education access to jobs things like that so first i don't buy that inequality is a problem you know in, in in capitalism right so there's inequality but i don't think it's a problem as 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 sam said i'm gonna say i don't care about inequality and i don't so i care about poverty i don't care about inequality so what happens to poor people under capitalism one of the amazing things if you look at free economies, again, to the extent that they're free, relative to what we have today, which I think is a lack of freedom, but to the extent that they're free, is that two things happen. One, capitalism tends to produce more jobs than there are people. So you get massive immigrations into capitalist countries because there's so many jobs being created. So poor people can get jobs. They, 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 the unemployment rates under capitalism, and again, the closer you get to f true free markets, the more this happens, that unemployment rates are basically approach zero. Second, because of the investment in capital, the productivity of labor goes up dramatically. So wages go up. So people become less poor, not because of a handout. People become less poor because they're becoming more productive and therefore they're rising up. Uh, you know, you can see this in, uh, in uh, 19th century America. You can see this in 19th century England. You can see this in Hong Kong. It's, it, Hong Kong's a brilliant example because 75 years ago there was nothing there. There was a fishing village. Seven and a half million people live there. Why? Because people went on rafts to get there, no safety net, nothing guaranteed except their freedom. Freedom of contract, not even voting, so not even democracy as we understand it. Uh, 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 property rights and contract law respected. People went there, created their businesses, built wealth, and, and built a life for themselves. So that's, that is the way poverty gets eliminated, right? Now, you might ask, well, what about the people who can't? Right? There's a certain percentage of the population, I think it's well less than 1%, but there's a certain percentage of the population it, they got into an accident, they, they, you know, something happened, and they can't take care of themselves. What happens to them in my ideal capitalist economy? People help them voluntarily. So those people are dependent on other people one way or the other. And the question is, is that dependency going to translate into a legal claim against me? Is that dependency a moral claim against me? If you're suffering, if you got into an accident and you're suffering, does that mean I am obliged morally or politically to help you? And my answer is no. Not morally, I don't owe my life to you just because you're suffering, and certainly not politically. So the question is how you convince me voluntarily to help you, and of course the people closest to you are most likely to help you, and the people further away are less likely to, uh, to help you. But one of the things that happen, happens in a, in a free capitalist society is you get civil institutions, voluntary institutions, not coercive institutions, that help out people who cannot help themselves. So charity is the main form that takes. But there are all kinds of other mechanisms, mutual aid societies, uh, unemployment, unemployment, private unemployment insurance. There's even insurance against poverty in some capitalist countries in the past or semi-capitalist countries. Uh, you know, insurance against poverty that you could buy you know, to protect you from those kind of accidents and things like that. In other words, you're still dependent on other people, but now you have to ask for the help instead of demand the help, which is the system we live under today. Today, if you have a need, you, you can use the force of government, guns, in order to take my money and, 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 and get help. I think, again, I'm against force. I'm against coercion. I'm against authority. Maybe I'll, I'll say something about the same sure. too. It's a, it's a great question, I think. Um, let me just say something about poverty again. Um, so uh, it's striking that the only countries that have really eliminated poverty are probably some of the countries you like least. So again, the Nordic model, Scandinavia. There basically is no poverty in those countries. They're not very capitalist. Um, I think of these things on a spectrum. So uh, you might as well. Well, actually, no, you don't, because you only define capitalism as that one extreme end. But, but, but really, there's a spectrum. Um, and the question is, to what degree is society in control of the economy? The more the answer is yes, the more socialist it is. Norway is quite socialist in that sense. Society exerts a lot of control through, the, through its very democratic state over the economy. And one of the things it does with that control is it taxes a lot, and then it redistributes that wealth to do a lot of useful things among them, basically eliminating poverty. So um, the, you know, the answer to your question in the American context is, we need to have more social spending. We need to have more taxation. We need to do more uh, to, help, to help people. For, for instance, I'll just end with this. Um, here's one thing we could do. We could have a universal basic income um, that would 
literally eliminate poverty overnight. Uh, we could literally just give every American $15,000 a year, um, divide it up monthly if you want, and bam, poverty's gone. I have a question for Yaran, is that correct? I am talking about pie, so we're going back to the pie. Sure. Um, but you seem, you say there is no social pie, like there's no pre-existing pie. There is only the pie that we create. And I'm running away with this pie thing. But I mean, I think at least from my perspective, this is the one argument I would have against like a libertarian capitalist system is that, I mean, that's just not factually true. I mean, I was born, my family is not wealthy. I was still born into a family that could provide for me. And I was born with a pie. I mean, and so at what point in my life, if I grow up and I get a good job, like I've always been expected to by everyone in my life, and I say, this is my pie, nobody else can have it, like, that's just not true. I was gifted some percentage of this pie through the arbitrary luck of being born into a middle class family. So how do you justify saying that all wealth has been created by the people who currently? Yeah, that's good. Good question. Um, so. It's true that you're gonna benefit from the fact that your parents created a pie. And their parents, they might have benefited or might not have benefited, I don't know what their situation is, from, from their parents having created a pie. So you're gonna benefit from intergenerational pie baking, right? <laughs> um, but, okay, so what, right? It's still somebody baked a pie. It's still not our pie. It's your parents' pie, and they choose to give you a piece of it, right? But they chose voluntarily to share that piece. And it's sad that some people don't have parents who have baked a pie for themselves. And these new people, these people, these young people have to start from scratch. And they're in some sense at a disadvantage, right? Because you've got a little bit of pie that you can leverage for your future. And they don't have that pie to leverage for the future. But remember, somebody always baked the pie. There's no pies that just poof come into existence. Pies get baked by individuals, by people. So there are these disadvantages. I'm not going to pretend that we all have equal advantages or we're all born equal in the contrary. I, I, I admit completely, we're all completely different. Again, look around the room. We're all completely different. We have different abilities, different uh, qualities, different characters. That some of them we shape ourselves. Some of them are just issues of luck. That's life. That's life. Now the question is, given that, how do we create the most opportunities for those people who weren't born with a piece of their parents' pie, or however you want to see it, right? How do you create a system that provides them with maximum opportunities to bake a pie, their own pie? And I think freedom is the way to do that. I think leaving them free, and we can get into the economics of, of why you don't want to tax Bill Gates, why taxing Bill Gates is like the least efficient thing you could imagine using his capital for. That, that the capital left in the hands of Bill Gates is far more productive and far more creative in terms of helping people create little pies if he actually invests it rather than if you take it away from him and start distributing it. Uh, so freedom is the best mechanism to create the most, not equal, the most opportunities for everybody, including those who are most disadvantaged by the fact that they weren't born to the right parents or weren't born with the right genes, right? It's what you do with what you have and the environment in which you live, a capitalist or a socialist, I believe capitalism provides you with the most opportunities to actually succeed in life. And I, I'm gonna stop there, but at some point I'll comment in Scandinavia, we'll, we'll find an opportunity to do that. May I just, just say something about this as well? It's a really good question. Uh, just on the issue of opportunities for the least uh, among, you know, for the, for the worst off. It, it just doesn't seem plausible to me that a kid born to, a home, to homeless parents in libertarian utopia who have to rely on charity and oops, they're not likable, so nobody gives them charity. It just does not compute with me that that kid has the most opportunity any human society imaginable could give anybody. That just isn't true. Uh, look again at in our country, bad though it is in many ways uh, from the standpoint of justice, at least kids have access to you know, public school, um, you know, food stamps if they're poor, et cetera. Uh, and we could do much better. You know, we could do much better on this score. But again, if, what you, if, if you're really serious that you want a society that extends the most opportunity even to the worst off, there's just no way you would pick a libertarian society. There's just no way.
Okay, so a movement towards a socialist society, and you think about why America was created, because we were leaving a government that was, um, you know, it was suppressive, people thought they had more rights than they were being given. A movement to a socialist society, isn't that us kind of going backwards and neglecting American values and tradition? Uh, good, okay, so um, I'm no scholar of the American Revolution, so I, I, won't, uh, I won't speak to the motives there. Um, but on the issue of whether socialism would, would represent an abrogation or a break with fundamental American values, um, no, because th there could be a, a completely liberal, egalitarian, freedom-loving, bald eagle flying version of socialism. Um, call it, so here I'll explain maybe a little bit of this proposal I didn't get to before, uh, and I'll be quick. Uh, Matt Brennig, uh, a, a wonk, a, a socialist wonk, there's like one of them, and he's the only one. Uh, he, he has a, a think tank called the People's uh, Policy Project. He proposes something called the American Solidarity Fund. It works like this. Uh, the government sets up a fund, an index fund, like Vanguard or whatever, and every citizen gets one share. Now, you cannot sell your share. Instead, you get the dividends that come from owner, owning that share, just like rich people get to do now with their Vanguard funds. Over time, the government fills this fund with more and more assets until eventually it, this fund, which we control because it's for us, it controls over half the economy. Voila, just like that, without any scary production violently, which I don't remember writing about, but apparently I did. Um, <laughs> you know, no, no violence, no force. It's just using the, the, the instruments that fin financialized capitalism has given us. Thank you, capitalism. We're going to use financial funds to socialize the means of production. And now every American gets every year a basic income from this fund. And I don't see any incompatibility with American values there. Um, instead, I see you know, opportunity and freedom. So let me, you know, let me comment quickly on that. I mean, really, there's no force there. First of all, how do you fund the fund? You fund the fund by forcing people to contribute to it. Contribute, in quotes, because you're forcing it, which is what taxes are, force, which is, uh, you know, which is coercion, which is force. And then how do the investment decisions make, get made? They don't get made by, by, by means of who is the most productive, by means that Vanguard or any of these mutual funds do today. But they would get based, they would get determined by political means, the same as culpers and colsters make their decisions for pension plans in California. They, you'd have this pressure group and that pressure group and that pressure group over there that each would lobby for investment in their particular industries and their particular areas in life. And it would be an unmitigated disaster and to the extent that they don't half the economy. Yes, half the economy would be crippled by the fact that now government, democracy, the people, own them in a democratic way. Today, if you don't want to own certain shares, if you are in Vanguard, you can sell your shares. But here, you can't even sell the shares. So your, your, your contingent on this ability of people to manipulate the system politically by yelling or by shouting or by demanding or by using other means, by, by, by coming together. And, and the allocation of capital under socialism, I mean, everywhere it's tried, it is an unbelievable, unmitigated disaster. I mean, any experiment, with the exception of, I hear the same stories about these communal firms in Spain. They're the only ones that anybody ever uses because the fact is that when you actually collectivize the means of production, even if you do it by the workers owning it, not the state, which is, you know, I, I lived in a country like that. The, the labor union was the number one employer in the entire country. This is Israel in the, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. The labor union, and it was unbelievable disaster. Israel was poor. It's become a first world country because they've got rid of the collectivization. Venezuela, and I know you're not allowed to bring up Venezuela, but Venezuela collectivized its farm system. That's, that's why they're starving. Because every time you collectivize farming, you starve. Again, Israel used to have a kibbutz, which is like the most softest form of socialism possible. And without government subsidies, without subsidies from rich Jews overseas, the kibbutz was a complete and utter financial disaster. And, and, and socially, social interaction within the kibbutz was like the ugliest, the ugliest human relationships I've ever seen. In capitalism, People are benevolent because the way in which we deal with one another is through trade, not through your benefit is at my loss, not through taking from some, I was going to say stealing, because I believe it's stealing, stealing from some and giving to others. So I, I think at every level, spiritual and material, 
the, the, what socialism produces and what capitalism produces are night and day in terms of their values. Um, so I have a question regarding the, the whole pure capitalism concept, yes. right? So in terms of like what's happened in the past with like Lehman Brothers, 2008 financial crisis, like all of these things happen because of the frauds and the crooks, right? And well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell I mean, you what happened. You well, yes, but asking. without the government to self, or the, like, just ba regarding basic economic principle, you think that the invisible hand will work very well, but without the government self-correcting, or like government correcting a non-self-correcting economy, it ruins a lot of people's livelihoods. And even if the market always self-corrects, the government itself is part of the economy in the sense that basic economic theory, like you have like the government sets a policy rate, they have their yield rates for their government bonds, like, and they have their in charge of the currency in which every economy works on. So how is it that capitalism can be so pure and distinct from the government that it's possible to... So let that? me be very clear on what I believe pure capitalism is, right? The ideal capitalism. It's a way there's no coercion. So the government does not control the currency. You compete on currencies. Banks issue currencies, just like they did before 1914 when the Federal Reserve came into existence, just like they did in Canada until the 1940s when they only adopted a central bank in the 1940s. And Canada's had zero banking crises. We've had 12. So the question is, why do we have 12 and they have zero? To a large extent, it's because we have, over, we have regulated our banking system far more than they have since the founding of America, because, because Hamilton and Jefferson fought, and, and, and in a sense, Jefferson won the argument. So our banking system has been unbelievably fragmented. In a, in, a, in a destructive way. But let me, let me quickly, because it's impossible to do this quickly, quickly just tell you what I think caused the financial crisis, because this mythology that financial crisis was caused by capitalism is, is, is it, because there was no capitalism in 2007, and it, it, the crisis happened in eight, right? Uh, and where did the crisis happen? In, in two primary industries, mortgage industry and banking, very related. Two of the heaviest, most regulated industries where there's more government intervention in all these industries than any other. Banks today are basically public utilities, where everything they do, they have to get permission from the bureaucrats. You want to nationalize the banks? They're already nationalized, right? At least, at least they're socialized, their costs are socialized, and they were bailed out, and they had too big to fail. Too big to fail is a strategy of the Federal Reserve since 1984. It's not new. It didn't come about during the financial crisis. It existed when continental Illinois was about to go bankrupt in Chicago and the feds bailed them out. So if you're the CEO of a bank, you don't have to be corrupt. All you have to do is follow incentives created by government. And you, you're winning on the upside and on the downside you have no risk. So you take on a lot of risk, which is what they did. But think about housing. Think about mortgages. Think about Freddie and Fannie, not institutions of capitalism. These institutions created by government to increase home ownership. Why is government interested in how many people own homes, right? So if you look at the financial crisis, and, and, and if you go to my YouTube channel, which you should all subscribe to, <laughs> I have an eight hour, eight session course uh, where I analyze the financial crisis in great detail. And let me tell you, it's caused from beginning to end. And I think almost every economist will agree to this in about 10 years. From beginning to end, it was caused by government programs, government interventions, government incentives, government controls. It would have, it, those kind of crises, that kind of systemic risk, does not exist in, in, in pure capitalism, and you don't find it, those kind of crises happening the closer you get to capitalism. It's when you, the central bank is the primary evil here. I'll just, I'll just quickly say, maybe, maybe those crises don't exist in pure capitalism, but they sure as hell exist in our capitalism. And the only, uh, the only people who are going to try to stop that are Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. My question is mainly for Sam, but you both can obviously chime in. Um, so in your critique of capitalism, you said that wealth falls into the hands of a few people, and uh, those people get really rich, obviously. And then you also said that wealth equals power in our government and that normal people have no effect on politics because of this, which I think is a very fair critique. Um, and then you also say that rich people's interests are not aligned with the interests of the people. So I just want to know what you define as the interest of the people, because that's collectivizing a group, I mean, if we're speaking in the US, of 300 million people. So how do you create one broad set of interests of the people for farmers in Montana, for bankers in New York City, um, et cetera. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And you're right. Um, 
it's too simple to think that the people have some interests. Uh, there are lots of different coalitions amongst the people. Um, I guess from the socialist perspective, the key cleavage is between cap the capitalist class that owns the stuff and the working class that then is driven through um, not owning the stuff to go work for the people who do own the stuff. Um, and while it's, you're absolutely right, there are going to be interesting uh, differences of interests within each of those groups. So what's, you know, even within the capitalist class, what's good for uh, you know, solar panel manu manufacturers is not good, what's good for ExxonMobil, for instance. So there, there are interesting conflicts there. Within the working class, boy, that's a big class, right? I mean, the way that I just defined it, it's like anybody who relies on a wage rather than capital income. That's like 90% of the, of the people. Uh, and there may be some interests that are shared amongst all 90%, uh, but they're gonna be important divergences. So absolutely right. Um, there are those some things we can say in general about the way that the capitalist class as such, con their interests conflict with the interests of working people. For instance, capitalists want lower taxes on their stuff. Working people, uh, it's in their interest to, generally speaking, not always, but often, to raise taxes uh, on, on rich people so that, they can, that more, more of society's funds are available to put to, to socially beneficial uses. Um, I, I like the market. I like the profit motive. Um, the, I like Norway. Norway has a market. Norway has the profit motive. It just doesn't have uh, the sort of rapacious uh, capitalism that we have here. And there would be, there would be profits, there would, there would be inequality. It's just that more of the social pie is available for public uses in a country like Norway. So just quickly, I think one of the differences is that I don't care about groups. I don't care about the rich. I don't care about the poor. I don't care about the middle class. I don't care about any of them. I care about individuals. And I care about which type of social system creates the opportunity for an individual who is willing to work hard, who is willing to apply themselves, who is willing to exercise their mind, who is willing to strive towards bettering their life, where is that individual better off? Where is that individual free? And I don't believe they're free uh, in Norway, and somebody should ask me about Scandinavia because <laughs> I have a lot to say about it and I don't want to take up this question to do it. Um, I don't believe they're free uh, in Norway to do that. Indeed, I think those who are actually ambitious actually want to produce something, actually want to be entrepreneurial, if it was easier to get to the United States, would probably be in Silicon Valley, not in Norway, because that's where they would be, get excited about actually producing and making stuff. Um, so I'm interested in the individual. Am I interested in freedom? I'm interested in getting rid of coercion, in getting rid of force, in getting rid of people telling me how I should live my life. And any system that is based on the group as the standard, there's always going to be a minority that is going to be oppressed by the majority. There's always going to be a minority that's oppressed by majority. That is the nature of pure democracy. This is what the founders of this country warned us against, is that pure democracy where the majority oppresses the minority. And the smallest minority is what? What's the smallest minority? The individual. And the individual always gets screwed when the so-called group interests are involved because there are no such thing as group. You pointed. There is no such thing as a group interest. Groups don't have interests. The only people who have interests, the only unit that has interests are individuals. And I want to make it free for them, as free as possible for them to engage in those interests. Oh, you want to do Scandinavian? <laughs> So I, I, I actually spoke at the University of Bergen a few years ago and gave a talk on the evils of the Scandinavian welfare state. <laughs> it, it, didn't go, it didn't go too well in Bergen, in Bergen Norway, uh, but it was a lot of fun and, and there was a lot, of, a lot of engagement and a lot of interaction. I mean, I'm not going to use Norway as an example because Norway is slightly cheating because they have oil and, and, and give them credit. They've managed that oil reserve in ways that other countries have not. They've done a, a very good job of managing that oil and the money that's coming in, and, and that's a big product of why Norway is significantly richer, for example, than Sweden and Denmark. But um, I, I spent a lot of time in Sweden and Denmark. I, I, I give a lot of lectures there, and I, I, you know, I don't see this, the, the uh, what do you call it, the, um, um, the utopia that is Sweden. So let me give you a quick, a quick history of Sweden, and I'm sure people will challenge this, but my version of a quick history of Sweden that I think aligns with reality. Before 1870, Sweden was the poorest country in Europe. Uh, m many of the Swedish immigrants that came to populate the United States left Sweden during that late part of the 19th century because it was so 
poor. And it was poor because there were no property rights. It was still, it was still basically still remnants of feudalism in Sweden. In 1870, Sweden did what many other countries have done, which is adopted the basic elements that move you towards capitalism. Again, not the pure capitalism, but as close as people have come. Uh, from 1870 to about 1950, Sweden was the freest economy in Europe, the most capitalist economy in Europe, actually one of the most capitalist economies in the entire world, and indeed rose and became on a per capita GDP basis the richest country in Europe. Um, Sweden had many of the large industries. It was an incredible, successful, prosperous country. From about eight, 1960 to 1994, Sweden decided that they were going to redistribute that wealth. They were going to adopt socialism. They were going to nationalize certain parts of the industries. And they did all that. And they became poor. They became poor. By 1994, they were bankrupt. By 1994, they, nobody would buy their bonds. They were basically Greece of today. In 1979, the, the, the most money-making industry in Sweden was ABBA. Remember ABBA? <laughs> most money-making industry in Sweden, because they'd lost all their industries. They'd lost their edge. They'd lost their success. A lot of the successful Swedes, like Johan Borg, the tennis player, the second biggest income producer in 1979 in Sweden, left so that they wouldn't have to pay the high taxes in Sweden. He moved to Monaco for a while. Um, in 1994, they were bankrupt. And since 1994 to today, most of the governments in Sweden have been right of center governments. Most all of the governments in Sweden have actually done something that is unthinkable in the United States. Unthinkable by Republicans, never mind Democrats. They cut government spending. They actually reduced government spending. There is no deficit in Sweden anymore. They run a balanced budget. But by the way they do that, while having a significant less progressive income tax than we do. The rich pay a lot less in comparison. So in Sweden, everybody pays taxes, not just the very rich. In the United States, we have a very progressive tax system. So they've cut spending. They've shrunk the welfare state. And most importantly is they've reduced regulation on business. Indeed, in many respects, in spite of the large unions in Scandinavia, it's easier to fire an employee in Denmark than it is in the United States, or in Sweden than it is in the United States. Mobility of labor laws are far more rigid in California than they are in Scandinavia. Um, it's easier to start a bank in Scandinavia than it is to start a bank in the United States. In many respects, if you look at the economic freedom indexes, Sweden and Denmark are right up there with, with, um, with the United States. They don't, they don't, they're not that different than the United States. Indeed, when Bernie Sanders said that his ideal of socialism was Denmark, the Danish prime minister came out and said, wait a minute, we're not socialists. We're not a socialist country. And if you go to Denmark, you don't see socialism. You see, yes, more redistribution of wealth in the United States, but less business regulation. So they've come up with a different mixture in the mixed economy. Right? We have a mixture. We redistribute relatively little, but we regulate a lot. They redistribute a lot and regulate less. Both are way below what they could be. And let me just end with this. Uh, I recently read a, a, a study that shows that Danes in America, immigrants that came to America, now there's a, there's, a, there's a selection bias here, but Danes who came to America are significantly wealthier than Danes who stayed in Denmark. They're just as happy, because you know the Danes are supposed to be the happiest people in the world. Danes in America are just as happy in, Danes in, in, in Denmark. And Danes and Swedes and Norwegians in America live just as long in terms of life expectancy as they do in Scandinavia. So once you control for those genetic aspects of health, they're not any better over there than they are here. And happiness is probably more of a cultural thing than it is a, uh, something that we know how to measure in, in any kind of true form. So this is a question for, I guess, either of you, but you both seem to be advocating pretty radical views that are well outside the mainstream, and you've, you also both seem to acknowledge that the, the, some set of countries in the developed world from Sweden or the United States, whatever your model is, has done pretty well. In fact, has made huge increases in quality of life, whether eliminating poverty in Sweden or creating more wealth. So. Why is it that you're both so certain in different directions that these mixed econo economy models that have done so well are, are no longer viable or can be improved upon? Good question. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not certain. I mean, in the spirit of John Stuart Mill, I think it's important to be open to ideas. And, and you know, one, one learns what to think precisely through exchanges like this. Um, 
I think that the balance of evidence suggests that human flir humans flourish best in countries like the Nordic model, where the state takes a very active role in redistributing wealth. Um, and I think that the fundamental argument that I outlined earlier against capitalism, that um, under capitalism it's, it turns into plutocracy because uh, wealth equals power. Uh, I think that's a sound argument. And so um, I think that you take a model like Norway, where the state owns 60% of uh, national assets. And if you were to bump that up even further, um, move it in an even further socialist direction, uh, it would be more democratic and more responsive to the will of the people. So um, yeah, social democracy, you know, one and a half thumbs up, uh, socialism, two thumbs up. So um, I, I'd say thumbs down on both of those and three <laughs> thumbs up for capitalism. Um, but look, yeah, the mixed economy works okay, right? And it, it's part of the challenge of being radical because, man, life's pretty good. There's a new model of iPhone coming out next year. Everything's fine, right? <laughs> um, but I know what, or well, I think I know, <laughs> what's possible for human beings, what the real potential is. So two things. One, I think a mixture never stays a mixture. It drifts in one direction or another. I think in the United States, we've drifted towards the statist model. I won't call it socialist because statism can come in a variety of different forms where the state intervenes, but it might be on behalf of, you know, you might uh, plutocracy or fascism or you, there are lots of different models of statism. We've drifted towards statism dramatically in this country over the last hundred years. And I think it's our detriment. I think life is, is less prosperous. I think life is less good from a material and a spiritual perspective. I actually think one of the reasons that we still have poverty in the United States is because of the welfare state. I think the war on poverty generates poverty. That is, the war on poverty guarantees that there will always be poor people. Uh, generally, if you create a bureaucracy to serve somebody, they have an incentive to keep having people to serve. Uh, but also because I think it's taxing the people who actually create the jobs and create the wealth that would help raise people out of poverty. You don't raise people out of poverty but just by handing them a check. Um, so, and, and I, don't think, I don't think you spiritually benefit people by giving them a check. So I think there's a spiritual aspect to the evil of the mixed economy. Uh, that you, by handing them a check, you deny them the self-esteem and the pride that comes from actually working for a living. Because, and you tell them, you're too incompetent to get a job. Here's a check. Don't worry. You know, you don't have to work. But yeah, you do have to work. Not because of the money you get from work, but because of the spiritual value work actually provides for you. So, you know, disincentivizing work is bad spiritually for human beings. It's bad for their ability to be happy. So, and then why do I think, why do I need to be radical? Because look, I believe force is bad. I believe coercion is bad. Even a little bit of coercion I think is bad. I don't want to be told what to do, especially if you've got a gun in your hand. So I don't care if the gun is held by a majority or the gun is held by a criminal on a, on a street corner. It turns out that the majority usually has a more damaging gun than the crook in the corner. The crook in the corner can get my wallet, that's it. The majority can get all of my assets. They can take 55% of my income in California. They can, they can tell me how much to pay my employees. They can tell me how much profit I can make. They can tell me what kind of wages I can take if I'm the CEO. They can control almost every aspect of my life. I don't want other people, uh, I, I think it's immoral. I think it's immoral, so go, going back to the moral aspect, I think it is immoral for people to use force against one another. I think it's immoral to constrain human beings by use of authority and coercion. I, I, you know, freedom, the freedom of the individual to pursue his life as he sees fit using his mind, that to me is everything. And to the extent that you use force, even a little bit, I'm against it. Even, by the way, if you, could, if, you could, if you could say, economically, we'd be better off. I don't care. I, want, I, I value freedom more. And I don't think you can make that case, but if you could. Value is not what you produce. It's not determined by just you producing. There has to be somebody who values the thing you produce. So I can produce, I don't know, um, I can produce lectures. But if nobody comes to listen to them, they have no value. Nobody is valuing my lectures, so I'm not going to make any money. So if a farmer produces plants that people don't value, that people are not willing to pay for, to exchange for those plants, then the plants actually have no value. I agree, but 
in, from an economic perspective, right? Somebody if you're growing marijuana right now, you, you, you're doing pretty well because there's a large value and the supply hasn't really caught up yet with the demand, right? Um, it, it depends on the plant. It depends on the industry. There are lots of small businesses out there, including service industries, restaurants, for example, who don't make any money. And that's why you see restaurants changing all the time because entrepreneurs are losing money constantly. But the idea that the service industry just moves money around is just completely untrue and bogus. There's nobody, again, in a free market, and put aside the cronyism, there's nobody who works in a service industry who makes a lot of money who is not creating value. You might not be able to see the value. Most people don't understand finance. Most people think finance is paper shuffling. But there is no industry. There is no workers. There is no proletarian. There is no workers class without a financial industry. It is the financial industry that makes possible the existence of jobs. It is the financial industry, the paper shufflers supposedly, who decide on what projects are profitable, what projects are going to produce value to other people, and what projects are not, that create industry, that create, and this is a part of the, my problem with the state owning all this, is because there's such lousy, central planning is such a lousy methodology of deciding which industries to, to, to invest in and which not. The beauty of the financial markets is they are phenomenally good and investing in Apple and not investing in some other schmuck that couldn't produce anything close to what Apple did. They're really good at making those decisions. The service industry produces more value in many respects than any farmer who creates a plant. Apple, like everything else we have in the world today, is a product of a mixed economy. There's no question about that, and it's absolutely true that when the government goes in and funds all the basic research, then all the products that are based on basic research are going to be, you're going to argue, were funded by the government. But that's because the government has crowded out all private funding, and that's the only source of funding you can get for basic research. But the idea that if the government stopped funding those things and actually cut our taxes and gave us our money back, that basic research would not be funded by the private enterprise is just historically not true. It's, 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 it's happened. But I, I, I'll say this again. To the extent that a market is free, to the extent that a country is free, wealth is created. To the extent that a market is unfree, to the extent that a, that a country is unfree, wealth is not created. So if you look at the technology industry, it's relatively free. A lot of wealth is being created. You look at other industries that are heavily regulated, heavily controlled, not free, you see a lot less innovation, you see stagnation, you see complete regression in our thing. You know that every generation of airplane over the last 40 years has been slower than the previous generation of airplanes? They don't get faster, they get slower. And, and airplanes are unbelievably, unbelievably regulated. The last innovation in airplanes was the Concorde. And that got wiped off because of regulation. There's no supersonic jets anymore. So regulation cripples, statism cripples, socialism cripples, capitalism, the elements of capitalism that exist in a society are what allow for any economic growth. OSHA is the safety, work safety place uh, uh, regulation that came in. And you always see the graph, they show you this point where OSHA comes in, and since OSHA, the number of bad stuff that happens in workplaces, the number of bad stuff that happens in workplaces has declined significantly, right? So everybody says, look, OSHA worked. It's declined significantly. Less and less people are getting hurt by, uh, in, in the workplace. But what they don't show you is the graph before OSHA. And the graph before OSHA shows exactly the same decline. So the workplace is become, becoming safer and safer and safer and safer without OSHA, and then continue to become safer and safer and safer with OSHA. The idea that manufacturers want to build product that kill their customers, the idea that McDonald's without bureaucratic, government-employed uh, food safety inspectors would poison you is bizarre. I don't know a single businessman who believes that the way to make money is to kill your customer. But that's what you assume. It just doesn't exist. Boeing isn't safe because of the FAA. Boeing's safe because that's how they make a business. And when they're not safe, right now you can see what's happening to their stock price. Right now when, you know, you've had two plane crashes. Maybe I'll just say something about um, a philosophical issue that uh, has come up a number of times. <clears throat> that gets a part of what you were asking. To what extent are we responsible for what we produce. And, right, and of course, we're gonna take very different views on this. So you, you've outlined um, an interesting view according to which, you know, it sounds like uh, on your view, Steve Jobs is sort of 
completely responsible for the iPhone. Um, th this is part of the libertarian, I think, sort of fetishization of entrepreneurs, uh, the valorization of you know, the Silicon Valley, VC, venture capitalist, entrepreneur types. They're the, you know, the titans of industry, the heroes in the Ayn Rand novels, who they're the ones who do all the stuff. And so without them, we would all be screwed. And they deserve, therefore, everything that's coming to them and, the, and the, you know, the torrents of wealth and income that they can capture. Well, it's all, it's all deserved. This is, you know, kind of laughable. I mean, you know, even take Steve Jobs, who was no doubt quite skilled. In what sense did he make the iPhone? There are millions, you know, uh, I don't know about millions, there, there are tens of thousands of people, probably hundreds of thousands of people involved in all the supply chains involved in making an iPhone, all the way down to, you know, probably slave labor in Africa digging in, in rare earth mineral mines. Um, and without, without them, uh, there wouldn't be an iPhone. It's true, without, you know, without Steve Jobs' input, there may, might not have been an iPhone, although you know, maybe you could find some other tech bro who could figure it out. But um, you know, a lot of people contributed. And this is just to illustrate a larger point that's really important here. All production is social. Um, nobody makes anything by themselves. We live in a society, whether we want to deny it or not, we depend on each other. This is a system of cooperation. Libertarians deny this, and they, they, they fetishize property rights, and they're like, this is my stuff, I made it, how dare you point a gun at me and take it away from me? To me, that's just hyperbolic. That's not what we're talking about doing. We're talking about acknowledging, like mature adults, that we live in a society, and we have to cooperate and we ought to care for one another to some minimal extent. Even if that means you can't buy your seventh yacht or you know, for somebody like me who's certainly not buying yachts but you know, I can't take a fancy vacation because my taxes go up. Well, if that's the price we have to pay to have a minimally just and decent society where everybody, even the children of the poor, have a fair chance in life, I'm willing to do that. So I, I guess uh, this is almost like a closing, I suppose, but I, I, I don't know how much more time we have. Um, I, I, I personally think that justice requires an economy that's justifiable even to the worst off. This is the core John Rawls commitment. Um, you justify a society by looking at its worst off members and you ask, could we justify the way we're organizing things to the worst among us? And uh, you know, the sort of radical libertarianism um, would be an absolute nightmare for the worst off. Whereas um, social democracy, socialism would be quite good. Okay, I have a question for you, Yaron. Yeah. So you've said that the role of government is to protect people, that that should be the only role of the government, right? Yeah. Okay, so do you believe that there should be governmental limits on what people can own? No. So can people- oh, Well, uh, weapons, you know, weapons, I think there should be limitations on what people can own when it comes to weapons, yeah. So do you think people should be able to own people? No. Absolutely not. Okay, so then can you please explain to me and justify under the capitalist or can't own people. quasi capitalist yeah. system that you'd argue is in yeah. America um, that you keep saying you want people freedom, 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 yeah. you're obsessed with freedom. Yeah. And you even gestured about coercion, that you don't want force and coercion. Can you please explain how mass incarceration in the United States has prospered under capitalism sure. because of the profit motive and the prosperity that private? ties to prisons have generated. Well, look, uh, you're not going to find anybody who's going to, you're not going to find me defending mass incarceration in the United States. It's a, it's a phenomena of the majority deciding to prosecute a minority. It's a, it's a phenomena of a majority deciding that uh, the drugs, that you should not be allowed to use drugs. I'm not going to defend that. I'm against that. I'm for drug legalization. And by drug legalization, everybody who's in prison today for drug offenses, nonviolent crimes, should be let loose, should be let free. I don't think that's a phenomenon of capitalism. I think that's a phenomenon of statism. It's the phenomena of the majority dictating to the minority what's good for them or what's bad for them. Now, I happen to think drugs are bad for you. Don't do them. But the only mechanism by which I should be able to enforce that is through argument. I should be able to convince you that drugs are bad for you, don't use it. I shouldn't be able to curse you not to use drugs. But that's what the state is trying to do. So the war on drugs to me is a microcosm of the entire you know, status socialist system. It's an attempt to regulate individual human behavior. And I think it's, I think it's wrong, it's corrupting in, in every dimension of it. And it's not only that, there are so many other reasons people go to jail that do not have to do with what I consider real crime. Coercion, violence, force, 
that, uh, that, uh, that, that should not be jailable. They should not be crimes. Uh, for example, you know, maybe this will be controversial to the people on the right. Uh, crossing the border of the country, right? Exercising your freedom as an individual to move, to travel, should not be a crime that puts you in jail, should not be a crime that separates families, should not be a crime that is, uh, that is uh, you know, the way we treat it today. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on mass incarceration, and, but I don't think it's a phenomenon of capitalism. I mean, let's have uh, free markets and drugs. I, you know, again, I hate drugs. I'm not preaching use of it. But, y you know, you have a right to shoot yourself up with anything you want to. You have a right to commit suicide. Why? Because you have a right to your own life. And the right to your own life gives you a right to do with your life as you see fit, as long as you're not imposing, not cost, because you always impose cost, but unless you're imposing violence on somebody else. Wow, we've got a lot of questions for this late. <laughs> so, all right, so I'm 35 years old, and when I went to high school, college, there was socialism. There wasn't democratic socialism. I think this is a new phenomenon that I've, that I'm, that suddenly, uh, you know, become commonplace in, I'd say in the last 10 years or so. What I was always taught socialism was the basic definition, uh, government owned, uh, own, uh, owning the means of production. And I appreciate, uh, and by the way, this, this um, question is going to be mainly for you, Dr. Arnold, but, um, the, the, and Yaron, I, was, I appreciate you giving you your definition of pure capitalism, which I agree with, okay? And I've always understood the definition of socialism just to be that, government owning of the means of production. Now, I don't think that, that I've, I'm not clear on exactly what you're advocating for, and I'd like you to define democratic, so I, I knew that you said earlier that you're for the Nordic model. I would argue that the Nordic model isn't socialist. They have socialist redistributionist programs, but because there's private owned property and private business, they are inherently capitalist. So I would like to hear your definition of democratic socialism and what you are specifically advocating for here in the United States. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, no, that, that, that's, that's a great question. So <clears throat> I think there are three players to talk about here. There's um, capitalism, which is private, private ownership of the means of production. There's statism, state ownership, and then there's socialism, which is social ownership. Now, social ownership means democratic control. State ownership can, can be a way of realizing that, can be part of the toolkit we use to implement social control, but not always. Statism can go really, really wrong. So Soviet Union, moral disaster, state ownership, no social ownership. There's no sense in which the, you know, the, the 500 members of the, you know, the Politburo, or the, you know, the 10 members of the Politburo running the, company, running the country, they did not represent the people. That was not social ownership. So democratic socialism unequivocally rejects statism as such. It does not want the Soviet Union. It does not want unaccountable bureaucrats running the economy. It doesn't want central planning. Instead, democratic socialism says, Let's reduce the influence of private economic power and increase the, the influence of democratic power over the economy. There are going to be a lot of ways to do that. Um, one way, the Nordic model, as I said earlier, I think it's sort of a spectrum, right? So it's like, there's not like one threshold where it's like, ah, we've reached socialism. Like we now can all, you know, start drinking, you know, lemonade and, and riding unicorns. Um, it, it, there's nothing like that. Instead, it's a spectrum. It's a matter of degree. To what extent is the economy subordinated to democratic will. The more the answer is yes, the more socialist the country is. Now, I think uh, a lot of countries are fairly far on, on that spectrum. I think they could go further. One way to, to do it that I haven't talked about yet is uh, a, a model called market socialism uh, or economic democracy by this philosopher, David Schweikert. And there's a lot of parts to his model. I won't go into all of them. The key part for right now is he proposes social ownership of um, of social control over investment. So here's how that would work. Right now, in our system, if you want money to expand business, you go to a private bank and you, you, you get a loan or not, you get finance or not, on the basis of profitability. The bank looks at your proposal and says, how profitable is it likely to be? Can you pay us back? That's the only consideration. Under his model, there are no private banks. Instead, there are democratically accountable socialized banks that are responsible, you know, responsive to we the people. And these banks, we, we give these banks marching orders. And we say, banks, 
We want an economy that works for everybody, not just for elites. So when, you're, when, when businesses come to you and say, hey, we want to expand production, we want to do blah, 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 we need money, don't just look at profit. Look at profit, but look at other things too, so that profitability does not crowd out everything else we care about. So for instance, look at sustainability. Uh, look at job creation. Look at whatever other criteria we democratically choose. Now, it's a complicated model. I've only explained part of, part of it, but hopefully you can see how if, if we did this, right, this would nudge the economy further in a socialist direction, precisely because it would, um, again, help us, the people, start to control the economy to a greater degree. So um, good question. What is socialism? It's social control over the means of production. How to get there? There are a lot of different proposals. So let me, let me quick, uh, just one thing uh, to add to that. One of the beauties of capitalism is because it's a system that basically leaves you free, you can experiment with models like this. Nobody's going to stop you, right? So under capitalism, if you want to go start a commune, you get, get a plot of land or start a bank that is run by voting in the community or any way you want. You can experiment with all these things, and as long as you're vi not violating other people's property rights, as long as you're not using force, as long as you're not using a gun, you can do these things. And I think that all fail. I don't think there's any question that they would dramatically fail in comparison to the incredible efficiency of the actual banking system, which is amazing. Um, again, not in the United States because it's heavily regulated, but, but that's the beauty of capitalism. It's, it's about freedom. So if you want to start a commune from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, Go for it. Live a miserable life, you know, uh, in your commune. But the, as long as you're not using force, as long as it's all voluntary, it's fine. But try to be a capitalist, somebody who believes in freedom, no coercion, in a socialist world. You can't. You're going to be you're going to be dictated to. You're going to be told what to do and how to do. And this is why this is the fundamental moral question: Is it right for the group to rule the individual's life? Or, can, or should the individual be left free to live his life as he sees fit? That, to me, is the, is the fundamental moral issue. And I don't believe the group has any business in my life, any group. You know, and, and, and this is why rights in a declaration, as inconsistent as was applied and has been applied, are inalienable. You have a right to life to be inalienable. It means nobody can take it away, even a majority, even 99%. They can't vote your right to life away. Well, if you take that really seriously, then that means your choices that you make in life cannot be voted away and shouldn't be voted away. I have um, kind of a response to that uh, from uh, Don Corleone. You know, he always said that uh, he's been in the world of guns and in the world of finance, and he yeah. always considered the world of finance to be much more dangerous. And so <laughs> I think that uh, one of the things that I've been struggling with um, about you know, considering you know, capitalism for my entire life is if we were to go to a more deregulated style of, of capitalism, it seems to me inevitable that it would have a destabilizing effect on society as a whole. You have these experiments, and that's great. You're right. You're free in a, in a free market you know, to, to, to have these experiments, and a lot of them are going to fail. But isn't that going to necessarily lead to a, 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 a society that is largely destabilized? And uh, the, other, the other thing that I've noticed, um, especially now, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably easy to say you know, to any critical question of capitalism, well, you know, that's because it hasn't been really tried yet. Um, I, I think that um, a lot of these are, are uh, philosophical ideas that are hard to get to a real understanding. Of. So I just want to uh, caution anyone listening that, you know, you've got to really think about this. I've got really in depth and really listened to. So I'm really proud of everybody here. Um, the last thing I would ask is, you know, if I were going to make my own pie, right, um, I would start off with wanting access, not necessarily ownership, right? And I think we conflate those things a lot. And I think what's important is access to a kitchen and to an oven and to flour and to sugar. Now, um, I have to ask, is my sugar contaminated, right? These are the sorts of things that um, we have to actually ask the question. We have resources in common. I don't have, own five gallons of the ocean that may or may not be polluted by plastics that are profitable for people to not care about. So I, I, my question is to be, to be to anybody, um, how, how, do we, how do we actually deal with these things that cannot be specifically allocated? Thank you. Oh, OK. You, you ended on a different question than I thought you were asking. I, I, I thought most of that was targeted to me, so I'll start. Um, I mean, let me, let me just comment on this issue of cooperation. Because of course, Steve Jobs didn't build it himself. Nobody would argue that he built the iPhone himself. But 
everybody along that supply chain, with the possible exclusion of the slave labor in Africa, which I'm certainly not going to justify, was paid. And was paid enough so that they did the work. That is, everybody in a capitalist society exchanges values for value in win-win relationships. Otherwise, they don't enter those relationships. And yes, 10,000 people to one Steve Jobs, but you know what? There's only one Steve Jobs. The 10,000, not all of them are replaceable, but a certain percentage of them are more replaceable than a Steve Jobs. It's supply and demand, right? So, so the, the, the people who actually assemble the iPhone in, in China are probably easily replaceable. The engineers who help them in China are probably not very replaceable, so they own a higher wage. And they add less value, right? The guy who actually assembles the iPhone, anybody can do that. So you doing it as an individual, you're adding the least amount of value. The guy who added the most value to the entire supply chain, including all the people at Apple who worked on the design and Ives and all these guys, the guy who added the most value was Steve Jobs. And that's why he gets the most, right? And, and again, it was all voluntary. Again, and I'm putting aside the slave labor because slave labor is evil and, 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 and clearly I would be against that. Um, in terms of plastic in the ocean, and, and I, 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 I'm gonna have a response that you're gonna laugh at, but it's my response and I believe in it. Um, I mean privatize, right, the ocean, uh, or the use of the ocean in some way or another. Um, in, in Iceland, they have found ways to privatize, in a sense, the fishing stock. Uh, and, and again, I'm not an expert on this, so I, I don't have solutions to every problem the world has ever presented. But I do know, <laughs> surprisingly, but I do know that privatization works. You don't dump your garbage in my backyard. The more backyards you create, the cleaner the environment becomes. So the fact is that when the Berlin Wall came down, the thing that really shocked people was not so much the poverty, but the filth. The filth. When stuff is socially owned, owned in quotes, it's filthy. Nobody takes care of it. The fact is, and this is true everywhere you go, everywhere in the world, the fact is the private property is generally clean and taken care of because it's mine because I care about it, and there are legal incentives to do it. If you dump your garbage in my backyard, I sue you. There's a well-known mechanism for dealing with polluting somebody's private property. The more stuff we can privatize, and I don't know exactly how you do it, but the more stuff you can privatize, the more stuff that we care about we will have. I'll give you one quick example. I think it's elephants, but I think it also applies to lions in Africa. The way the elephant, elephant stock has been declining for years in Africa because of poachers who go in and kill them. The way they have saved the elephant in Africa is basically by privatizing the elephants. They've, they've, they've created private reserves where they're allowing hunting, but now the private, the private entity has an interest and a motivation and an incentive to stop the poaching because the poaching cuts into their profit. They hire so people can buy licenses to shoot the elephants from the private owner. And now the private owner has an interest in reviving the elephant stock because you need more elephants to shoot. Now, I don't like that in the sense that I find shooting an elephant to be pretty despicable. But the fact is that the more elephants because of this mechanism than there were before, and the same thing happened in, with fishing in Iceland and I think actually Norway. I think Norway has a very creative privatization kind of model of fishing and fish stock and how to do that, which I can't elaborate because I don't know it. Um, but imagine if we could do that on a larger scale. Imagine if you could do that over the ocean because people have uses for the ocean, it would clean it up. It, it would wouldn't make it dirty. It's an interesting, yeah, an interesting idea. Uh, could you speak to the other issues of uh, the, um, uh, the, the idea that perhaps uh, the economics is just as coercive in certain circumstances as you know a gun? Um, and uh, the, other, the other concern uh, being, um, well, I'm sorry, I'll just let you finish. Okay, so I'm not sure what that means exactly, because I, I know that there is this idea that, that economic power is the same as political power. If I'm, if, if I'm, if I'm the only job provider in yep. a, a, perfect, you know, a, a specific uh, job. Yeah, so move. I mean, I mean I, I move, I'm serious, right? So if you're in Southern Ohio, I mean, one of the things, one of the complaints I have about modern America today is if you're in Southern Ohio and you don't have a steel job, instead of going, voting for Donald Trump so he can impose tariffs so you can save your job while killing 40 other jobs, how about just get in a car and drive to Northwest Arkansas where there are plenty of jobs, 
where they, where, they, where they wanted listings. That's what we used to do in America. We used to go to where the jobs are. We didn't, we didn't believe that we were born and going to die with the same job. We didn't believe that our generations were going to... So you move. And, and, and again, if you look... Now, I said that pure capitalism has never existed. And I, you know, Ayn Rand wrote a, a book called Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, because it's never been actually practiced. But again, the closer you get to that ideal, the more jobs are actually created. People got on rafts and were willing to swim to make it to Hong Kong in order to get a job, in order to start a business, in order to provide for their family something. And GDP per capita in Hong Kong today is higher than the, in the United States. So you can, and there was no safety net, or there's very minimal safety net and very minimal social services, what we consider as the basic. So all of it very minimal. And yet people went there because they had opportunity and they had that desire. So they wanted to be free. They wanted to be free from coercion. And they wanted those opportunities that freedom actually creates. So economic power and political power are not the same thing. With economic power, there are always options. Always options. With political power, there's no option. There's no option. I don't pay my taxes, I go to jail. I don't follow the regulations, I go to jail. There's a gun. With economic power, there's no gun. And there's a fundamental difference between those two types of economic. You don't like your employer? You're not getting the right wage? Leave. There are plenty of other employers in the world today. You don't like, uh, you don't like uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, McDonald's? Go to some health store and buy, you know, vegan burgers. I don't know. Uh, I mean, the beauty is you've got options and you get to choose. In that sense, it's the most democratic system ever because individuals, democratic in the sense of individual choice, individuals choose with their feet, individuals choose with their wallets, individuals have options and they make their wishes uh, expressed in their market activity without coercion. I, I think this, this reply is emblematic of a, a a mistake common to the libertarian right, massively overestimating the power of exit to check private power. Um, most people can't pick up and move to, you know, Northwest Arkansas. Moreover, we see here a flaw in neoliberal capitalism. Get rid of borders, get rid of communities, commodify everything, move to where the jobs are, abandon your family, abandon your friends, abandon your church, abandon everything. Everything must be subordinated to profit. That's where this, le that's where this, this ends. But you know, maybe that's sounding pretty good to me, actually. I I'm kind of into this private property thing. So maybe what we should do is this. Uh, you, we, as you were talking about oceans, <laughs> pri privatizing oceans, I kind of got, got, got interested in that. Let's, what, and I'm, this is, I'm, I'm genuinely curious what, what you would say to this. Yeah. Suppose we privatized the entire surface of the earth, and then I'm big shot, awesome entrepreneur, I become fantastically wealthy, and I, through a series of perfectly voluntary transactions, I acquire the whole damn earth. Well, among the rights of private property are the rights to exclude. And I notice there's seven billion other people on my stuff. So I say, this is, this is infringement of my rights. Maybe out of charity, I will allow you to continue to exist on the, the surface of the earth, which I own, but uh, you better, I hope I like you, and it turns out I don't like you, so get off. And then, among the rights of private property are the rights to enlist the state to enforce your property rights with force. So uh, I don't, it looks to me like a reductio of the whole position. Uh, if his position is true, if I were to voluntarily, through voluntary transactions, acquire the surface of the earth, it follows that justice would enable me to kick all you off into space and die. That to me looks like a reductio ad absurdum of the whole position. Sure. I mean, yeah, you can create science fiction nonsensical examples. It, it's, it's, a, it's a counter example. It's not. It, it's there, a counter example. There's no counter example here because there is no possibility, and we can walk it through the example of anything like that ever happening. And indeed, you've had basically private property in the United States. So most of the United States, at least most of the East Coast of the United States, is privately owned. Has anybody ever approached even close to owning the entire East Coast of the United States? But if they has did. anybody even approached? Owning the entire island of Manhattan, is anybody but even if they did, if they did. But they did, but they can't. But if they did. No, but metaphysically, <laughs> but metaphysically they can't. You can't go against But will you nature. admit that if they did, and if, if I decided... But they wouldn't. But, they, they, you can't... Oh, uh, I don't know. That's not how philosophy no, works, but you Yaron. can't hypothesize a That's metaphysically not how philosophy impossible... Works. It is how philosophy works. <laughs> it's how good philosophy works, but it's a bad philosophy. <laughs> you don't hypothesize a, something that's metaphysically impossible. 
Because, yes, the metaphysically impossible is impossible. Yes, if that happened, it would be wrong. But it is metaphysically impossible for such a situation to occur. I mean, it's just not, a, you know, it's just not an example that actually has any reality, uh, any reality I, to I, it. So I, 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 don't I, do, I don't believe philosophy is about trams or, <laughs> I, you know, or, yeah. high, or, or, or metaphysically impossible situations about what would happen okay. in a different universe. Um, so, so I don't, I don't think it's a legitimate. I, it's not, I don't think it's a legitimate question. Say, oh, questions like, if 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 uh, one property owner is surrounded by another property owner, and how do you access your property that are somewhat realistic that you can you can come and you can see situations like that? And they've always been in common law in the theory of property rights. They've always been ideas about access and how you could you should be able to access your property and exit your property. So the law is always provided within capitalism for the ability to, to deal with real situations, you know, like that, mm. that are, you know, like, like the absurd one, mm. but well, ones that are more realistic. Well, I would just really draw a distinction between things that aren't going to happen and things that could happen, although they're extremely unlikely. And the scenario I sketch is not going to happen but I don't see the metaphysical impossibility. And I think it, it's a really telling example because what it forces you to say but you won't say is this. You are willing to protect the rights of private property, let the heavens fall. And that's what libertarianism is about. It's not about freedom. It's about protecting private property, guys. That's what it's about. They dress it up in freedom, and I, 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 I respect what you've said, but sure. I, I think this is really the core issue. Yeah. No, it's, I, it's like, yeah. oh, just, sorry. Go, go ahead, uh, sorry. I know I interrupted you, so, but okay. um, libertarianism is an ugly, selfish philosophy. So you can't just pre present it as such. You've got to dress it up by talk of freedom. Because talk of the rights of private property doesn't really inspire people, because that's just protecting rich people, and most people aren't rich. What, so what libertarians do is they don't talk about private property, they talk about freedom. What the counterexample forces libertarians to do is acknowledge that in a scenario where protecting private property legitimately acquired entails literally booting all of humanity except for the private property owner off into space, they're kind of inclined to protect private property. Uh, but he won't quite say that. But that's what follows from the theory. This to me is a reductio ad, absur ad absurdum, not just, just, not just of Ayn Rand, but of Robert Nozick and, and, and all libertarians who put property rights at the center of the theory. I think property rights are important. I just don't think they're the only thing that's important. So let me just respond to that because it's important. Uh, one, yeah, we're selfish, so I'm not going to walk yeah. away from that. Uh, I believe individuals' uh, primary moral responsibility, the only moral responsibility in life is to their own uh, prosperity and their own well-being and their own survival fundamentally. Uh, and that does not mean you live in a desert island, it does not mean you treat other people like shit, it right. means you respect their rights as well. But I am for rational egoism, um, and, 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 and I'm an ad advocate for that. I don't think it's ugly, I think it's beautiful. Um, and I don't put property rights at the center. I don't think property rights are at the center. Uh, and this is why I think this is a ridiculous example. Uh, this, at the center is the right to life. There's only one right. Property rights don't exist in a sense. There's only one right, and that is your right to your life. That's it. Your right to your life means you have the freedom to act in this world in any way you please, accumulate whatever property you happen to accumulate, and I think you have to accumulate property in order to survive, but, it, but again, property is a derivative of your right to your own life, your right to this, to you, to being you, to making decisions for yourself, to using your mind as you see fit. Property is a derivative of that right. And, and let me just clarify, because it's important for the video, because everybody's left. I'm not a libertarian, for whatever hmm. the distinction matters. I, I think libertarianism is too big of a tent. Hmm. I don't consider myself belonging to this tent because there are people there that I consider, I know many consider me crazy, but I consider crazy. Uh, I think anarchism is, 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 is not, is a bad idea, is, a, is an evil idea. It's really wrong, and I don't want to be in the same tent as, as anarchists. So I don't consider myself a libertarian, I consider myself an objectivist for, for whatever it's worth. But, and an objectivist places the right to life as the center, the right to liberty, the right to pursuit of happiness, the right to property, all derivatives of the fundamental right 
to your life, which means the decisions you make, which means to the actions you take in order to achieve your life. And in that sense, I'm an egoist. You have a right to pursue the values you believe, rightly or wrongly it turns out, that you think will promote your life. I don't believe I have a right. I should be able to interfere in your ability to do that as long as you're not interfering in my ability to live my life. So property is an outcome of that, not the foundation, not the beginning. And here I, I'm different than a lot of the libertarians who start with property mm -hmm. and, and go from there. I start with life. I just want to know what your uh, opinions are on Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez and her Green New Deal. Uh, just whoever wants to answer the question. Yeah. Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't looked at the Green New Deal in, in great detail, so I, I, don't, I don't know the ins and outs of it. But certainly the idea that we need to have um, a really important, massive, urgent response to climate change, I, I don't see how anybody could, could deny that. I mean, climate change, guys, is an existential risk. Uh, this is, this is a, a, your generation, I'm not that old, my generation too, uh, we're gonna be dealing with this. Um, this, is, this is an existential threat. And um, I, I think we need government to do something major. And if the Green New Deal is, is part of that, then, then great. We, we, certainly, we, we need collective action. And the only way to get that right now is through government. And so I, I to that extent, support the, the Green New Deal for sure. I, I'll just say I'll be the one person who disagrees. Uh, you know, I don't think climate change is an existential threat. I don't think there are many or any, I think the only existential threat to humanity is humanity. That is uh, nuclear bombs and war, I think, are the real existential threat. I don't believe climate change is. We have the ability to deal with anything nature throws at us. We are amazing at figuring out solutions to these problems. You don't need a massive, complete remaking of the US economy. I mean. The, the new deal that she published, I think she withdrew it from their website, but the one she published on her website was nuts. I mean, it was every single building in the United States within 10 years would be retrofitted. Uh, there would be no positive carbon footprint. I mean, I guess we stopped breathing. It, within 12 years, uh, I mean, I guess we kill all the cows. We have to, she talks about killing all the cows, so we stop eating beef. I mean, it's, it, it truly is nuts. Um, Climate change happening, not happening, whatever's happening to the climate, it's changing. It always changes. Oh if it gets significantly warmer, there are all kinds of things that we can do. For example, Canada will become habitable. Maybe some of us will move to Canada. Um, <laughs> I'm serious about this stuff. People have moved throughout human history because of weather. This is not new. There were, there were ice ages, and humanity moved around because of the ice age. There are going to be costs, but the amazing thing is if we allow the economy to grow, if we allow wealth to actually be created during this period, then we'll be rich enough to be able to deal with whatever climate throws at us in the decades to come. And let me just say this about this generational thing, because this depresses me. I mean, I've never seen a generation so depressed than young people today. I mean, you're convinced that the world's going to end. It's not. It's not going to it end. It is. <laughs> Millennials, millennial cults have always existed. And we're just replacing one millennial cult with a new millennial cult. 1989, the IPCC or whatever it was said we had 10 years to fix climate change or we were all going to die equivalent. That was 1989. It's, it's 2000, whatever, 19 already. And you know, life's pretty good out there. Um, life's pretty good for pretty much everybody. It's not like the climate is destroying human life anywhere on the planet right now. Uh, right now, it's 12 years. Let's meet up in 12 years and we'll figure out whether human life is being demolished, because we're not going to do anything about climate change, let's be real. Nobody's going to actually implement the Green New Deal and the Chinese are not going to do it. And if the Chinese don't do it, then carbon emissions are going to still accelerate through the roof. Um, let's meet in 12 years and see how many people have died because of climate I still remember uh, the population bomb in 1968 by, by Ulrich, who is a big climate change guy. I still remember the global freezing. I still remember uh, Carson's book, uh, that we're all gonna buy of cancer uh, at a young age because of chemicals. Life's pretty good on planet Earth. Start enjoying it. Stop being so depressed about the state of the world. I would just urge you not to take my word for it or his word for it, but look at the science and read, if you wanted to Google one thing, Google life after warming, the uninhabitable Earth. This is a book that summarizes the state of the art science 
the overwhelming consensus on this is that he's dead wrong about this, and we better get our shit together ASAP. Well, we'll say the overwhelming consensus is, there's overwhelming consensus about warming. There's no overwhelming consensus about catastrophic warming. Yeah, talk, to the IP, talk to the UN IPCC about that. Yeah, UN has incentives. <laughs> um, this is backtracking a little bit off of the whole, like, Good. entire world <laughs> thing, but <laughs> in the um, previously mentioned capitalist utopia, what stops companies from paying unlivable wages to their workers? Like, for example, most clothing companies pay like 12 cents an hour to the people who make their clothes. What would stop people from being given these unlivable wages while companies are only incentivized to pay the top ranking person, the person who gives out the wages themselves the most, and they don't owe anything to that bottom worker? Well, none of that is true. Right? There's no incentive to pay the guy at the top a lot because as shareholders, you want to pay him as little as possible too because any money he's getting, you're not getting as a shareholder. So the incentive is to pay everybody the least you can get away with, right? theoretically. What stops it is what's stopping it right now. It's not, the minimum wage is not dictating wages right now. What dictates wages is productivity. If I pay you less than you are worth, worth in a sense of how much you can produce, you leave and you go somewhere else. What stops it is competition. What stops, uh, I mean, not to mention just the fact that, that uh, uh, you know, in an advanced society, in a society like, in a rich society, nobody's incentivized to, to encourage poverty, right? But the fact is that, 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 you know, competition solves this problem and it's always solved the problem. So the fact is that the 12 cents an hour that people are getting in Bangladesh or wherever, if you, if you actually track wages in Bangladesh, and I encourage everybody to go and actually look at the data because the data is amazing, right? Every year those wages are going up. Every year they're getting paid more. Every year it, it, it's getting higher and higher for two reasons. One, they're actually learning a skill so the individual is actually making more money because they're actually becoming more productive. But the second reason why overall wages are rising is because the productivity of labor generally in the economy is rising and therefore their wages are rising and they're demanding the wages because they could go across the street to a competitor. So markets actually work and the only thing that raises wages, the only thing that raises wages is increased productivity. Nobody is going to pay somebody $15 an hour who's not producing $15 an hour or more. It has to be more than $15. So if I'm forced to pay somebody $15 an hour who's not producing $15 an hour, there are only two, two possibilities. One, I go out of business because I can't make a profit, right? I'm paying them more than what they're producing. Second, I replace them with a iPad in, this, in, 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 in the case of, uh, of McDonald's, or I, replace them, or, or I replace them with some kind of mechanization. So I'm never, you know, a business cannot survive if it's losing on its employees. So what determines wages is productivity. And what makes sure that wages go up is competition. Here's something that might drive down wages, automation. So um, a lot of you have probably heard about AI and all the advances, and I'm curious too what, what you might think about this, uh, Yarn. Um, Suppose that you know the the the, the most sci-fi scenarios come to pass, and robots, you know, like Westworld or whatever you've seen this, like we got like awesome robots and we've got awesome AI, and it just turns out that it's way more cost-efficient for companies to get rid of humans and replace them with AI and robots. I mean, we've seen this in a lot of industries already, like CVS. You go to CVS, the you have kiosks now instead of cashiers. Uh, Self-driving cars are you know just a couple years down the pike. Um, you know, fast forward this 10, 20 years. And it just turns out companies don't particularly want to employ very many people. And we've got an unemployment rate of 50, 60%. I'm curious, uh, I know what I would do about that. I would have a universal basic income and I would think this could be the pathway to utopia because work kind of sucks. And if we could just have people work 10 hours a week and spend their time doing what actually matters, which is spending time with family, friends, developing hobbies, self-realizing activity, that sounds pretty good to me. I'm curious, though, you know, what, 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 yeah, sure. how you might handle that. I mean, first, I don't think work sucks. I think, I think for every worker, work is essential for their own self-esteem and their own pride. So I think work is part of human life. Now, maybe you can replace it with hobbies and stuff like that that serve the equivalent purpose. Maybe in some utopian future that happens. Um, I, you know, I have, <laughs> I have socialist relatives, uncles uh, who are socialists, quite, quite adamant ones. And I remember... Uh, meeting up with, with my uncle in 1980, it must have been 87, because I was on the way to the US, 
and I spent a little time with him and we'd, we'd yell at each other and argue. But one of the claims he was making in 1987 is, with, it's the same with the environmental stuff, like any day now, there are going to be no jobs because then it was PCs and computers and, and stuff. And it never happens. This is the same argument made at sewing machines, same argument every single period. People say, yeah, but this time is different. No, it's not. And, and this is the reason. The reason is that human needs are infinite. We can't imagine the stuff we will want 20 years from now. And it's still true that robots can't replace and will not replace in any kind of foreseeable future everything that we do. And indeed, I, I think this whole distinction between robot and human long term is really not going to exist because we're going to embed the robot in us or whatever. You know, we're going to have the chips in our brain. I'm not sure that's a good idea <laughs> uh, because somebody might be able to control that. But, I, you know, we don't know what the future is going to hold in terms of how robots develop, just like we didn't know how computers, but this I can guarantee, there are going to be plenty of jobs. I mean, one of the things that I notice, and maybe you guys notice about other things, is, is when I drive in California, um, I, I look around the strip mall, and strip mall after strip mall after strip mall, they're nail salons in the strip mall. I don't know if you have them here on the East Coast, there's many nail salons. Like, 20 years ago, there were no nail salons. Like, only the rich got in pedicures and manicures. And yet, there's a whole, there are thousands of, of people today working in pedicures and manicures. Now, I don't know if it's a good job or a bad job, I would hate that job, but some people are doing it, they're making a living off of it. And that's a whole industry that didn't exist 20 years ago. There are lots of industries like that that we can't even imagine would exist 20 years from now. I can think of a few that I'd like, you know, travel with me, um, uh, you know, to, 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 to help me out in all kinds of ways. Personal assistance might become, I mean, there are all kinds of things that we can't imagine that will be so wealthy that we'll be able to afford. So I, I don't worry about jobs because I think that, again, capitalism, freedom produces uh, the needs of human beings under freedom are, are infinite. We can imagine things and people will be there to supply unimaginable things. And robots will just make it all easier. It, so yes, maybe we'll only have to work 20 hours a week. Or maybe only 10 hours a week. And we'll be able to do other stuff that, uh, during that period. That's not a bad thing. That's generally a good thing. And generally today, overall, we work a lot less than we worked 50 years ago. We work a lot less than we worked 100 years ago, and certainly that we worked 250 years ago. We, actually, the time worked right, is shrinking for most, for most professions and in, in the United States and in Europe, in most Western countries. And I think that's going to be a trend that continues into the future. We'll be able to control more of our lives because we become wealthier. Robots are going to allow us to be rich. Um, and, you know, we can talk about UBI, but... You stated that... Um with wealth comes power and political influence and all that stuff, and people like Bill Gates have unfair amounts of money. Yeah. And I'm wondering at what level, kind of in the dollar amount, you think is too much money and too much power and too much influence? Uh, right. So I don't know. I, I don't have a dollar number. Um, uh, so my, my answer is going to be kind of a non-answer, I'm afraid. Um, I, think, I think some inequality is functional for an economy. I think allowing people, you know, rewarding people who work harder or produce more value um, with higher incomes is within limits fair and essential. Um, I just think that there, there comes a point and it's up to economists to figure out what the point is um, where inequality becomes dysfunctional for an econ uh, uh, inequality becomes dysfunctional for an economy and for a democracy. Um, one, one possibility here that we haven't talked about is you could partly block the transmission of wealth into political power through sensible campaign finance regulations, um, or even, I mean, there's some pretty interesting ideas out there. Uh, you could get rid of elections entirely, um, get, get rid of elections and, and pick people for Congress at random from the population. It's called lotocracy, interesting idea by a guy named Alex Guerrero at, uh, at Penn. And uh, that's a pretty awesome idea. I mean, I'll, I'll explain that just really briefly. So like, Rather than, you know, it, it's kind of nuts if you think about it. We've got, we've got these people we elect. They, they're beholden to a donor class. They show up on Capitol Hill. They're in a million committees. They're supposed to be experts on everything facing Congress. This is not humanly possible. Um, they spend most of their day fundraising, for one thing. <laughs> they're not like reading committee reports. And, and two, they, don't often, they don't, often aren't experts in, in the issues they're faced, that they're actually legislating on. So here's a radically different way of, of, of doing this. Instead of electing people, let's just 
break Congress up into like a bunch of different institutions, each focused on one topic. So you've got like an energy legislature, you've got like an education legislature, etc. And then you fill those legislatures by picking people at random from the population. Now they're gonna know nothing, right? Uh, more or less. So what you do is you have like a, like a six month Lafayette college style seminar where you bring in experts, competing experts, you bring in me, you bring in him, you bring in competing experts and you, you train them up. And then they serve like three year terms. And this, this would be, uh, I think worth, who knows what, you know, again, this is like back, you know, experiment, you know, <laughs> who knows what would happen. Um, I'm pretty sure that this system would be less beholden to a donor class since there are no more donors, since there are no more elections. So it could be resistant to capture by the elites in that sense. There's a worry about capturing the experts who come to give the presentations. I won't mention Koch brothers money here, um, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm, I'm not, I, that, that was a little, yeah. I, I'm not suggesting <laughs> you are. Sir. Um, it's been a long evening. I'm getting a little punchy here. Um, uh, but, um, so there's worry about capturing the experts, but um, there are ways, you know, th there are things, it's worth exploring. I mean, would that, you know, New Hampshire tries this out or something, you know, we, we need to just try some stuff out. So I, just a quick comment, I think anything would be better than what we have right now, so I'm, I'm <laughs> uh, but I think the best way to do this is to make politicians impotent, uh, in a sense, to make them mm. have little power. Um, and I, I'll give you a quick example, and I, you know, Microsoft in 1994 was the largest company in the world, and it actually spent on lobbying exactly zero dollars. It had no lobbying firm, it had no mm. offices in Washington, it did no lobbying, zero, nothing, nada. And it was invited in front of the Senate. And Owen Hatch, a Republican, stood up and yelled at them. You have got to get an office here. You've got to get a lobbying firm. You've got to participate in what happens in Washington. In other words, you've got to bribe me. And Microsoft literally, you can find the story you know, that was written about this in Slate magazine. Um, Microsoft basically said, you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. We're not interested. We don't want to lobby. We, you know, we're doing our thing. We're creating value. We don't need you guys. And they went away. Six months later, Justice Department knocks on the door. And what was the accusation against Microsoft? They were giving away something for free, Internet Explorer. That was the accusation. And what did Microsoft learn from the experiment? They learned that if they didn't lobby, the politicians were going to come after them. Google has never had antitrust problems. Why? Because they started spreading the money early, very early. Right in the beginning when they got venture capital, they started spreading the money to the politicians. So the system today is geared towards the politicians sucking influence. The only way, in my view, to stop that is to not give the politicians any power, to make the economy truly free, free of politics. And again, you can then run your experiments within that freedom, within voluntary exchange, you can run whatever experiment you want. But then there's no power of the gun imposed on our lives. I just wanted to counter your, your point, and then I have an actual question. Sure. Um, sorry. <laughs> no, go um, for it. You're debating more than one person. Yeah. <laughs> you're, You've been here long enough. You, you've earned it. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, your example was that you would have random people selected mm. to, to be in government, essentially. Right. right. So what limits that, though? Because it, it could go to the extreme of you know, everyone getting told what their job is. So that, that's, the, that's the extreme side of that. Oh, I see. Are we like forcing them to come? Yes, okay. it, it's because they may not want to do that. I see. Yeah, good. Let, me, let me answer that first. So, so this is, to be clear, I don't want to take credit for this or take the blame, depending on your point of view. This is a proposal by Alexander Guerrero uh, at Penn. His res response would be, we're not going to force people to come. Um, so it's not going to be like jury duty where it's like a legally enforceable obligation. Instead, we're just going to like really encourage you to come by making it worth your while. We're going to like pay you as much as it takes to like get high quality people to agree to do this. So if it takes a million dollars a year, go for it. It takes a million dollars a year. But you're free to say no. Okay. There's lots to say about that idea. Yeah. Anyway, so my other question was, I wanted to go back to your opening statement, how you talked about uh, your ideal system right. and it was uh, revolving around the government basically coming in and taking over a lot of the uh, factories, et cetera. And you mentioned briefly unions, but then mm -hmm. in today's world, unions have quite a bit of political play. So how does that really change mm -hmm. what we have now to do that? Because there's still 
a huge bias on on that. So, so uh, here, here's here's my uh, reading of economic history that's going to differ a lot from the <laughs> reading you just got uh, about an hour ago, not just got, but maybe an hour ago. I think the, the, the collapse of unions in our country has been a disaster for the working class. So only about like, I, I think it's around 10%, 14%, seven to 14%, something like that, of American workers are unionized. Um, used, union, union, uh, unionization rates used to be much higher in our country. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head what they were, but they were north of 30, 40%. And this is essential to, uh, to, 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 to to sandpaper off the sharp edges of capitalism, you just need for working people to have some counterweight to the power of owners. Owners are rich people who have a lot of influence and power, and they've got great bargaining power. And uh, if you're just facing Walmart as an individual worker, a lot of luck. You have no bargaining power. Walmart doesn't give a fig whether you quit or not. Um, if you have a union, if you unionize, you, you, you come together, well, now you're talking. Now maybe workers can actually get a fair deal. So I, I think the collapse of unions uh, in, the, in the 70s, starting the 70s, was a disaster for working people. And we would have a much more humane and just economy where the pie was much more fairly shared had that not occurred. Um, now, you can see this is not just, uh, again, I'm not going, this is not just my sort of unwarranted speculation because we can look at other countries that do have more egalitarian distributions of wealth and income, um, like Canada. Uh, and the Nordic countries, and they have much higher rates of unionization. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll just say, I obviously, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to unions. What I'm opposed to is the special power union has in the sense of, and I forget the name of the bill that was passed in the 30s that gives them uh, a huge amount of power vis-a-vis -vis employers. I mean, unions should be able to negotiate, but employers should be able to fire anybody who strikes, for example. They should be there should be no special government privileges one way or the other. Um, as to, you know, look, uh, there's no question Europe is more egalitarian, more flat in terms of uh, income inequality than the United States is. Uh, the United States has more income inequality. But the fact is also that we're much richer than Europe. If you take some of the richest countries in Europe and you place them on a scale, adjusting for cost of living, you place them on the scale of the United States, they turn out to be slightly richer than Mississippi, but, but not much richer, nowhere near even the average. Uh, you know, with the exception, I think, of Ireland, which is actually the freest country today in Europe, and, uh, and Switzerland, which happen to be the, the two countries that are wealthier on a per capita GDP than the United States, and where union rates are very low. Union rates are not high in Switzerland and they're not high in Ireland, but if I had a model and I wanted to say, I want to be like that country in Europe. I wouldn't use Sweden and Denmark, and I would use Ireland. Ireland has, is significantly richer than Scandinavia. Ireland has a dynamic economy, a growing economy, uh, and, and is, is doing, and they've even, you know, they, they've even gone to, the, to what I guess people consider the left on social issues, which I think is great. So they've legalized abortion and they've legalized gay marriage for a Catholic country that's pretty cool. So, uh, you know, I consider Ireland much more of a model within Europe, and in Ireland, the unionization rates are not that much higher, if at all, than the United States. Um, one of the reasons union rates have gone down is because they're not needed as much in a tech-oriented economy. Uh, they're not needed as much when individual productivity can be measured at a much better rate than it used to be. It's true that when everybody was doing the same job and you couldn't actually tell who was a better worker and who was not, then there was power in, in grouping together and negotiating as a group. But when you're actually the more productive person on the line and you can show it because now everything is measured and everything is monitored, then you don't want to be in the union. You actually want to negotiate a better salary because you're being more productive. You want to, don't want to be driven down. At the end of the day, what drives wages up is productivity. Unions could drive wages up artificially, but that does not help anybody in the long run. In the long run, you cannot make more money than you actually produce. Thank you, guys. And you guys, I, I will second what, uh, what Sam said initially. I mean, any way you can support this mill series, do it because the exchange of ideas. I mean, when we stop talking, yeah. then the fists come out, right? I mean, that's the reality. Yeah. It's, either, it's either talk or, or guns. Either we give up on reason, either we embrace reason or we, or we move to violence. Those are the only two options. <laughs>